All right. I would like to call the meeting back to order. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, uh, eating quickly so we can get back and proceed through our agenda. Next, we're going to go on to item number eight on our agenda, which is an introduction to the health risks associated with increased air pollutants caused by climate change. And uh, joining us to make this presentation uh, is uh, a representative from the American Lung Association. So please come up and as soon as you're ready, uh, you can begin. All right, can you guys hear me okay? All right, for the record, my name is Melissa Ramos. I'm the manager for clean air advocacy with the American Lung Association. I'd like to thank um, all of you uh, legislators for allowing me to be here today to present on the health impacts of climate change. As we are seeing now more than ever, climate change is a public health emergency and Nevada has made incredible strides to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, invest in transportation electrification, and other measures to mitigate climate change impacts on our environment and our health. Every year in April, we release our annual State of the Air Report, which is essentially an air quality report card monitoring our exposure to two of the most harmful um, air pollutants, ozone, which is more commonly known as smog, and particle pollution, more commonly known as soot. Ozone acts essentially as a sunburn to our lungs. It develops in the atmosphere from a mixture of gases coming from cars, trucks, buses, um, and factories. These emissions react when in direct contact with sun, uh, sunlight, creating ozone smog. Particle pollution is a mixture of coarse particles from dust storms, construction, pollution, um, pollen, sorry, and fine particles from the burning of fossil fuels in factories, diesel exhaust, and wood stoves and wildfires. In our 2022 State of the Air report, we found that over 137 million people are living with unhealthy levels of air pollution, and people of color are disproportionately impacted by unhealthy air. They are also more likely to be living with one or more chronic conditions, making them susceptible to the health harms of air pollution. The 2022 State of the Air report uses uh, three of the most recent quality assured data from US EPA, years 2018, 2019, and 2020. These years were among the hottest years globally as the seventh, third, and second hottest years on record. Climate change is a health emergency. We're seeing increased drought, destructive wildfires, extreme heat, all of which degrade air quality and increase the risk of air pollution harming health. As Nevada rankings in the 2022 State of the Air will show, we must increasingly acknowledge and address the growing impacts of climate change on protecting lung health. Here we note that more often the most polluted cities lists are located in the western United States as wildfires become more frequent and intense. In this year's report, all but one city um, is in the western U.S. where we've seen major spikes in particle pollution days. Nevada cities continue to rank among the top 25 most polluted cities for ozone and short-term particle pollution. Similar to last year, the Las Vegas area experienced fewer unhealthy ozone days um, in this year's report, but we also experienced the highest number of uh, unhealthy spikes in particle pollution days. Reno's air quality worsened in both ozone and particle pollution levels. So here we have the, break, um, the breakout of the top 25 most polluted cities list in terms of ozone. As you can see here, Las Vegas is 11th and Reno is 21st. Um, and these are the rest of the cities. So you can see where we are um, in retrospect to the rest of the country. And then this next list shows the top 25 most polluted cities for unhealthy particle pollution days. Reno, again, is right in the middle, ranked at number 12. And as although Las Vegas is not listed on this um, most polluted cities list, I want to again mention that we did experience the highest number of unhealthy spikes in particle pollution days. 
And also for reference, last year Reno on this list was ranked 21st and it jumped all the way to 12th in this year's report. So poor air quality can cause respiratory and cardiovascular harm, including heart attack, stroke, and even early death. Many people, including healthy young adults, have reported respiratory symptoms and decreased lung function, such as chest tightness, coughing, uh, shortness of breath, all within just hours of exposure. Air pollution can also worsen the symptoms in people with lung diseases, such as asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. 94% of Nevada residents are exposed to unhealthy air, but certain groups are more at risk to the health harms of air pollution. This includes children whose lungs are still developing well into adulthood, seniors whose immune systems may be compromised, children and teens with asthma, as well as adults with cardiovascular disease, basically anyone with any underlying health issues, people of color, and uh, people living in poverty. Marginalized communities face a greater risk when it comes to air pollution burdens, and these populations, uh, these numbers are the population numbers for here in Nevada in terms of the groups at risk. Historically, black and brown communities have often have underlying health conditions, and in addition, populations from lower socioeconomic status also lack access to care. Both of these factors contribute to the health disparities we're seeing from air pollution. The transportation sector is a leading contributor to these unhealthy emissions, which is why we need to see bold investments in zero emission technologies to address harmful air and climate pollution. In March, we released the Zeroing In on Healthy Air report, which, is a, uh, which modeled a transition to non-combustion transportation as well as non-combustion electricity. And the, these were the benchmarks that we used. So all passenger sales to be completely electric by 2035 and for medium and heavy duty trucks by 2040. Um, and we also modeled this on a non-combustion electricity grid by 2035. The results of this transition show, um, could yield $1.2 trillion in public health benefits, um, hundreds and thousands of asthma attacks and lost work days avoided, as well as um, premature deaths avoided. Air pollution continues to threaten the health and well-being of Nevadans. Um, and making this transition to completely electric transportation as well as a renewable electricity grid could yield $7.5 billion in public health benefits. And again, we're seeing hundreds of lives saved as well as thousands of asthma attacks and lost work days avoided simply by cleaning up um, our most polluting sectors, the transportation and energy sectors. And I'll just end with saying that climate change is making the job of clean air much more difficult due to extreme heat, drought, and wildfires, which are extremely common here in Nevada. And we can protect the health of our residents by pivoting away from the combustion of harmful fossil fuels and towards zero emission technologies in both the energy and transportation sectors. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you continue to keep public health at the forefront of these conversations to address climate change. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ms. Ramos. We appreciate it. I think it is <clears throat> helpful to look at um, some of the health impacts that we're seeing and some of the, uh, we can see similar health impacts from impacts of heat as well as from air pollution and so how those may stack as, as the previous presenter had discussed, uh, as well as some of the links between some of the things that are um, emitting uh, greenhouse gases are also emitting um, other air pollutants and so there's not only the the impacts of uh, warming, but also um, pollutants that are coming out at the same time. So I uh, appreciate you giving this, that overview. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions from members. All right, seeing none. Oh, we've got one. Dr. Titus, please go ahead. Sorry, I was trying like to get your Senator attention. Hansen. I apologize. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation, and thank you for uh, American Lung Association for all you do. Uh, I just wonder back on, um, I, I guess your slides aren't numbered, but um, you put down who is the most at risk from air pollution in, in Nevada. 
And, and I have worked a lot with the American Lung Association, but mostly in the realm of cigarettes, uh, cigarette smoking, nicotine, air pollutants that way. And I'm wondering where, if, if you've done any association with that particular 94% of Nevada residents are living in a community with poor air quality. Is there also an increase of um, people who smoke in that area? Uh, and also the association, if you smoke, uh, more risk for some of these uh, environmental factors because it's certainly smoking is a choice, and so I'm just wondering if you've done any studies with that. Uh, we do know people who smoke often uh, are more at risk when it comes to developing other lung health issues. And again, air pollution does exacerbate those lung health conditions. So we haven't done a direct study looking at those um, impacts on people who do smoke. Our data, when looking at the groups at risk, uses U.S. Census Bureau data as well as um, data from health and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, thank you. And uh, we, we did hear, certainly, that um, folks that since we've been living in this post-pandemic, now endemic era of COVID, um, that folks that were exposed to the smoke of the wildfires did worse with their COVID symptoms. So we certainly know that some of those environmental factors, some of that smoke issues made it worse. And I was just wondering where, if you had anything associated with the cigarettes uh, and smoking and that of all, of all folks, the Lung Association should have something like that. So I'd love to see anything if you do. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Assemblywoman Titus. And uh, I believe the Lung Association has worked on that. I think you raise a good point, which is that there's both indoor and outdoor air quality issues. We are going to hear about wildfire smoke right after this. Um, uh, and it is important, I think, to think about both of them. I know that they've done a lot of work just on uh, some of cigarette smoke and some of the indoor air quality issues in the past and are looking at some of the, the outdoor air quality issues. But you're right, there's certainly a connection between them. Uh, Senator Hansen? Thanks, Chair. I'm actually, uh, uh, I, one quick question. I'm not sure, you mentioned that Reno went from 21 to 12th, I think it was, uh, and the particle th account last year. That, do, do you guys uh, break out the fact that you had, what, four months of California fires that were causing that, those particles to come into the Reno Sparks area? Is, or is that, is that the actual cause for that dramatic jump from 21st to 12th or whatever the number was? Um, Melissa Ramos, for the record. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator Hansen. So the jump in from Reno going from 21st to 12th in particle pollution levels is actually exactly what you're saying. It's due to the wildfires that we've seen, and we've seen more wildfires become more frequent and intense in the southwest United States, which is why we've seen significant increases in particle pollution all across the southwest U.S., and again, um, as we saw, especially in Reno, Nevada. So a lot of the a lot of the smoke that we were seeing in Reno was coming downwind from California, um, but we are still seeing those health impacts again from the wildfire smoke. Very good. And Mr. Chair, just for a point of observation, you know, the Nevada Department of Forestry has done an excellent job managing the Nevada side of those forests, and we've seen a dramatic reduction in the Sierra Nevada fires since Nevada has actually aggressively managed those fire areas. Uh, just across that in that state line, you have the opposite policy, and the fuel load has built up and built up and built up, and that's where this particle problem that the young lady brings to our attention came from. Not from mismanagement on the part of the state of Nevada, but gross mismanagement for decades on the part of the state of California. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, members. Chairman, and it's sorry, I just also want to clarify one more thing. Uh, Melissa Ramos, for the record. Our State of the Air report looks at, uses US EPA data from our ozone and particle pollution monitors. So this is in no way essentially grading um, the, the efforts of our local air agencies or Department of Forestry. This is just simply looking at the data that we're getting from these monitors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, additional questions? All right. Seeing none, thank you again so much for your presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, and with that, we're going to continue to uh, uh, discuss issues related to air quality. Uh, we're going to welcome a representative from the Desert Research Institute um, to uh, present some of their uh, research and findings about uh, how wildfire smoke exacerbates certain respiratory diseases. Um, so welcome. Uh, as soon as you uh, have your presentation ready, you can introduce yourself for the record and begin. Uh, 
Uh, I think you need to turn on your microphone, sir. All right, try that again. Uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, uh, Daniel Kaiser, Assistant Research Scientist at the Desert Research Institute. Uh, I'm thankful for this opportunity to come and present to you guys. I'm here to describe the uh, health impacts of wildfire smoke that we have observed in northern Nevada and how those health impacts are likely to become more severe as the number and size of wildfires in California and the rest of the region increase. Some brief background on our research group and how we came to be involved in the study of wildfire smoke. I work for the Healthy Nevada Project, which is a large population health study formed as a partnership between DRI, uh, Renown Health, which is the largest hospital in Reno, uh, and Helix, a genetic sequencing company based in San Diego. Uh, we also have a collaboration with UMC here in Las Vegas. Thus far, over 45,000 people have joined the study. There are essentially two things that the HMP does. The first is that we provide for free genetic sequencing to participants and inform them of certain genetic findings. The second thing we do is population health research. This includes not just genetic research, but also research on environmental factors influencing the health of Nevadans. Unfortunately, exposure to wildfire smoke is an environmental factor that has become extremely relevant to northern Nevadans, and we have thus devoted significant resources to studying its impact. Uh, before I proceed to talk about wildfire smoke exposure and its impacts, I want to take a moment to describe how we quantify that exposure. Wildfire smoke consists of several harmful pollutants, but the pollutants of greatest concern is probably PM2.5. PM2.5 includes any airborne particle that is smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter. Uh, these particles are so small that it takes at least 50 of them to span the width of a human hair. Because of its small size, it can be hailed deep into the respiratory tract, uh, which is part of the reason why it is so harmful. Uh, PM2.5 can consist of a variety of different materials depending on its source. Thus, the health effects of PM2.5 from wildfires may be different from that of PM2.5 from other sources, such as vehicles, uh, industry, and airborne dust. Unfortunately, northern Nevadans have been exposed to a large amount of wildfire PM2.5 over the last two years. The satellite image on the right shows how the smoke plume from last year's Dixie fires and Calder fires in northern California drifted over Nevada. The graph on the left uh, depicts cumulative exposure of Reno residents to PM2.5 over the course of a year, with each line being an individual year. The dark black line shows the average cumulative exposure for a given day of a year from 2012 to 2019, while the green and red lines show cumulative exposure for 2020 and 2021, respectively. You can see that exposures in those years increased dramatically during the wildfire season compared to previous years. According to my colleague at the Washoe County Health District, Brendan Schneider, the 10 worst day for PM2.5 since measurements began in Washoe County in 1999 have all occurred in the last two years. Sadly, the wildfire smoke exposures we witnessed in Reno over the last two years do not appear to be an aberration, but rather the new normal. I have borrowed the graph shown here from a paper by Liam Banerjee published in 2021. The top graph depicts how the number of fires each year in California has been increasing since 1920 with an acceleration of a trend occurring around the year 2000. The bottom graph shows a similar trend for area burned in California each year. In the last few years, we have witnessed wildfires on a scale that have no historical comparison, at least not since the early 1900s. While there may be a large amount of variability in wildfire prevalence from year to year, the deep underlying issues of climate change and changes in forest management make it likely that we will continue to see severe exposures uh, to wildfire smoke for the foreseeable future. This means it is essential in the near term that we understand and ameliorate the health impacts of the smoke coming from the wildfires. Now I'm going to report on what the HMP has found about the uh, wildfire smoke health impacts in northern Nevada. Our first study, published in 2020, looked at the association of PM2.5 with the emergency visit for asthma uh, for the years 2013 through 2018 at Renown. Uh, so this does not include the most recent years of wildfire smoke in 2020 and 2021. The map shows the location of air quality monitors, urgent care centers, and emergency departments used in our study. 
we found that a 5 microgram meter cubed increase in PM2.5 in wildfire days, which is a fairly small increase, was associated with a 7% increase in visits. Other studies have reported similar association between wildfire PM2.5 and asthma, so no surprise there. However, another result from our study was that the effect of PM2.5 was much stronger when wildfire smoke was present than on days when it was not present. This suggests that for asthma, wildfire PM2.5 may be more harmful than PM2.5 from other sources, such as vehicle emissions. This is still an area of ongoing research, as differences in the composition of PM2.5 can result in differences in toxicity. Of course, other mechanisms may also be at work. Wildfire PM2.5 concentrations tend to be highest in the summer, uh, when people spend more time outdoors, and this might increase its effect. Regardless of the mechanism, the result is that wildfire PM2.5 may be especially harmful for northern Nevadans who have asthma, making this a population of particular concern as we anticipate continued severe exposure. Our second study, which we published in 2021, had to do with the association between wildfire PM2.5 and COVID-19 cases at Renown Health. The graph provides a summary of our data and our modeling. The black line is the seven-day average of a COVID-19 positivity rate at Renown, while the red line is the concentration of PM2.5. The blue line indicates our model predictions for cases if there had been no wildfire smoke exposure, while the red shaded region indicates the increases in the positivity rate attributable to the wildfire smoke. Based on our model, we estimated that the wildfire smoke may have been responsible for an 18% increase in COVID-19 cases at Renown during the affected period. Another study published shortly after ours by Jow et al found that 20,000 COVID-19 cases and 750 deaths could be attributed to wildfire smoke in the states of Washington, Oregon, and California in 2020. However, the relationship between COVID-19 incidents and wildfire smoke exposure is still an ongoing area of research as very few papers have been published on the subject. A cursory examination we conducted of 2021 renowned data did not confirm the association between wildfire smoke and COVID that we observed in 2020, and it is unclear why. Factors such as the introduction of COVID-19 vaccines, the replacement of the alpha COVID-19 variant with Delta, and the timing of a Delta wave may have all played a role in modifying the short-term effect of wildfire smoke. More research is certainly needed as the relationship between COVID and wildfire smoke appears to be complex, at the very least. However, the long-term effects of generic PM2.5 exposure on COVID-19 have been more firmly established. For instance, a study by Wu et al. in 2020 found that a one microgram increase in average PM2.5 exposure in previous years was associated with an 11% increase in COVID-19 mortality in U.S. counties. Since both wildfire smoke and COVID-19 are expected to be a problem for years to come, the possibility of both short-term and long-term effects of smoke exposure on COVID-19 in our population is concerning. So in summary, the wildfire smoke exposures experienced by Northern Nevadans were not an aberration and are expected to continue to be severe. For people with asthma, it is possible that smoke from wildfire is more harmful than air pollution from other sources, and we should expect the increase in smoke exposure to correspond with an increase in healthcare utilization for asthma. For COVID-19, associations have been observed between short-term exposure to wildfire smoke and the incidence and severity of illness, but more research is needed. However, based on studies of the long-term effects of PM2.5 on the severity of the pandemic, we should certainly be concerned about how continued exposure to wildfire smoke may make our population more vulnerable to COVID-19 down the road. Finally, I should mention that while asthma and COVID-19 have been the focus of our work, these conditions represent only a sliver of the negative health effects that have been observed um, due to wildfire smoke, and that associations have been observed with a wide range of other outcomes as well such as all-cause mortality, COPD, respiratory infections other than COVID-19, and cardiovascular events. Thus, it is important to consider the full range of health effects when evaluating the full scale of the problem. Uh, Mr. and Madam Chairman, that concludes my testimony. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Mr. Kaiser. We appreciate it. Uh, I think it is striking um, both the short and long-term effects um, related to 
wildfire smoke and uh, the, the importance that we treat wildfires not only as uh, an environmental or, or habitat issue, but also as a public health issue uh, and consider um, when we're dedicating resources to that, that it's not only um, to, you know, save property um, or uh, protect uh, uh, environmental resources, but it's also to protect uh, public health um, as well. So, uh, and I will note briefly that Mr. Kaiser does have another uh, uh, another commitment. So um, we'll get through as many questions as we can, but uh, when he needs to leave, we will. And uh, last thing I'll do is just make a plug. I've, I'm a participant in the Healthy Nevada Project, and uh, uh, I, I highly encourage everyone to look at it and participate. You can get free genetic testing and help contribute to filling in uh, a, a lot of uh, important data gaps and contributing to science in our state. So uh, with that, do we have any questions from members of the committee? And uh, let's see, I believe we do have some folks up north. I think starting with, we'll, we'll start with Assemblywoman Titus and then we'll come down to Chair Peters. Uh, thank you and thank you for that presentation. Um, I am very proud of that we have uh, the DRI in our state, especially uh, up here in the north, and have have followed what what the science has been uh, produced through through that agency, and very proud of that. Um, questions: I know that the DRI has been involved with the cloud seeding program and and water and increasing that. Um, has there been any association during trying to get the cloud seeding and some moisture to mitigate some of these fires? Uh, for the record, Daniel Kaiser, Desert Research Institute. Uh, I have not been involved with the, the cloud seeding at all. Um, we're fairly segmented in our work at DRI, so my focus has been, you know, pretty limited to just the health effects of the uh, of the smoke on uh, on um, on Nevadans. Um, and so I can't really speak to your question, and so I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and I, I understand. Um, just a follow-up then that maybe you can answer or, or just a suggestion that you take back to whoever you um, – whoever you work for or under, um, is there any association with DRI and forestry management to, to t get these fires taken care of sooner? Because the, the one thing that I'm hearing consistently is that, and I believe it, that, and, and I'm not questioning that, that the smoke causes bad things to happen. Not only is it wildlife and um, landscape, but also these health, negative health effects. So, to understand that, it's better in my mind. I like to be preemptive, and in healthcare, we always like to do things that are preventative. And so, for me, um, your agency working with uh, the Forest Service and, and both sides of the state, or, and not only in the state but also in California, to help put these fires out sooner or prevent the fires altogether and not just say, hey, there's global warming, so hey, we have more fires. That, that just doesn't make any sense to me as opposed to saying, hey, if we are going to have more fires, can we get them out sooner? What are we doing there? Where are we spending our money not to, to do stuff, uh, do studies that we already know, smoke is bad, um, but to prevent that smoke to begin with? And is there anybody in your agency that that is looking into that issue of what can you do to prevent these fires or put them out sooner, um, and, and do you have a department for that? Um, Daniel Kaiser for the uh, Desert, Re Desert Research Institute. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure that I'll be able to answer that question as well. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody at DRI who is specifically working on the problem of, of getting fires um, put out more quickly. Um, what I do understand is that it's a, it's a managing our forests is a, quite a complex issue. Um, and so, you know, it may not be necessarily a situation where we can eliminate all fires. Um, certainly one of the solutions that has been proposed to the problem has been uh, prescribed burns. Um, and of course, those come with their own risk as well because they also produce smoke. But one of the benefits of prescribed burns is the fires tend to be um, smaller, um, and produce less pollution. Um, and so I can't speak to your, to, um, your question, um, but I do want to just, just address that, you know, it may not be possible to eliminate fires completely. 
Well, uh, certainly, and I agree with that. And sorry, I know, uh, Mr. Chair, you want to keep going, but I, I know that we're not going to eliminate fires. We have natural things that create fires. We have lightning, and then we, of course, as long as human beings are on this planet, we're going to have uh, fires because we don't always make good choices. Do you know if you have a department there that are working um, well, for grazing to clean these forests, not just pr prescribed burns? Um, anything with the cattlemen, anything with grazing, anything of cleaning out that fuel that is there, which creates the smoke that then causes these health problems. And we can, you can answer that offline if you don't know, but I'd love to get some information from DRI about any cooperative agreements they're doing. You're the scientists. You guys, I would love to see you put some energy into mitigation of these fires. Um, I know you do uh, the cloud seeding programs. I think you're a great agency, but I just wonder if you're focusing on th things to me that are the obvious. To tell me that a certain size particle causes damage is something that we all know. So we don't need that. That's not new information. What I want you to do is think out of this box and give me some maybe some solutions and see what your agency is doing to, to think forward with this. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Assemblywoman Titus. And uh, we do have another representative from the Desert Research Institute. So I'm sure that we'll be able to get any uh, uh, information about your questions about some of these other research areas to you as well. And uh, I, I'm also very proud to have uh, DRI located in the state uh, now in the, the new district that I am uh, running to represent as their Southern Nevada campus. And uh, uh, look forward to working uh, with you and others. I know that this is not our, our uh, fiscal committee, but uh, looking to find ways to help support uh, DRI in conducting some of the research to, to connect the dots on this. And uh, again, I do think it's helpful to, um, to get some of this information because then uh, when we look at the, the public health impacts, I think when we look at taking on some of those initiatives, like you said, to get, to make, you know, to get fires uh, put out faster uh, to try and help make our communities more resilient, um, uh, so that uh, these fires don't get to, to huge sizes, uh, we, can, we can look at some of the impacts and the costs related to those in justifying some of those preventative aspects, much like, uh, uh, as you said, occur in the healthcare space. Uh, Chair Peters. Thank you, Chair Watts. Um, and thank you for the information. Um, <clears throat> I have been looking at your um, your graph with your three lines, the model data for expected COVID, the wildfire data, and then the actual COVID data from Renown. And <clears throat> I'm getting a little bit into the weeds on this question, We can, and I'm happy to take the, the response offline, but just wondering about how you're continuing to interpret this, this um, overlap, right, where we highlight that there is potential correlation between PM 2.5 and, um, and wildfire and COVID outbreaks and what that may mean in the public health arena, right? Does that mean we saw more people who are homeless in the hospitals during that period of time potentially looking for respite from the extreme um, wildfire smoke? and also positive with COVID, which may have exacerbated their desire to find respite from the, from the wildfire. Or um, I see that the school start date is on this as well. Those kids were, I, they were excluded actually. My children stayed home for the first week of August because they couldn't be in school in those classrooms safely while also having the wildfire scenario um, outdoors uh, and not being able to play. So I'm just curious what, how you guys are diving into that data. And again, happy to take that um, offline. Um, yeah, so Daniel Kaiser, uh, Desert Research Institute. Um, so if I understand your question, you kind of, you're interested in like, and who might be most vulnerable, um, like who are these people that are showing up in the hospital? Um, so we didn't break it down uh, by demographic group uh, in our study. Um, the, um, you know, I think maybe also you were kind of getting at, well, what could be the possible causes of seeing more people in the hospitals? And there have been a few proposed mechanisms. Um, one thing I should point out is that, you know, a link between uh, smoke in the air or particulate matter in the air and respiratory infections is not surprising at all. Um, you know, what's more interesting is that it's specific to COVID. So associations have also been observed with pneumonia, bronchitis, 
um, you know, both you know, non-COVID related uh, pneumonia and bronchitis, um, and then also with like things like the flu. Um, and so, you know, there have been possible mechanisms are that, you know, when we inhale that particulate matter into the lungs, um, the lungs are becoming more susceptible to infection because of the damage being done by the particulate matter. Um, there's also the possibility that the, um, the virus is actually adhering to the particles in the air, and so that's causing, um, you know, essentially hitching a ride into our lungs and thereby causing infection. Um, so there's a, there's a few different theories out there on why more people might be showing up at the hospital with COVID-19. Um, as far as, like, if it, you know, is concentrated around, like, really vulnerable populations, like the homeless, we don't really have the answer for that at this point. Does that answer your questions? Yes, and I um, I would ask for um, your agency, as well as anybody who's watching, if there's additional work being done on the public health arena um, space, like of of uh, looking di deeper into this issue, because I imagine we'll probably see this become more, more problematic. Thank you. And uh, again, I think, um, you know, we've got now two top rated uh, research universities here in the state, as well as uh, DRI, which is a, a global leader on some of this. And so, um, you know, figuring out again how we can uh, partner to continue to tackle these questions because I th one of the trends that we're seeing is that some of the things that we've seen now just raise additional questions, but then um, some of that information can also help us um, target better our, our resources and our responses to address some of these issues. Uh, I believe Senator Hansen has a question. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, Daniel, for the presentation. Your, your, your graph on your wildfire trends in California, you start in 1920 and you show in your graph clearly that, you know, slight upward trend, then it really takes off. Do you guys have a graph also um, of the amount of logging that occurred in this window of time? Because I would bet it's an inverse relationship between the amount of logging fire frequency, and burned areas and thousands of acres, because obviously in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, there was pretty uh, extensive logging operations in California. And of course, the logging also create roads and open up areas that create fire breaks and so forth. But Daniel, did you guys have any chance to do any kind of overlap between the amount of harvested timber and fires in California? Uh, for the record, Daniel Kaiser, Desert Research Institute. Um, so no, I'm sorry, um, Senator Hanson, I don't have that graph for you. Um, I have not looked at the, you know, the rate of logging in California. Um, but what I can share about, you know, the trends that you're seeing there is that there was what they called, you know, a fire exclusion uh, period. Um, and so that began, uh, extended until about 1970. Um, you know, the, the, the Forest Service had a policy of putting out the fires right away. Uh, and so that policy uh, was walked back. Um, and so you can see that, you know, after, you know, 1970 or so, we start seeing that upward shift in the, the number of wildfires and in the, in the area burned. Um, and one of the things I think that we do have to keep in mind is that, you know, wildfires are, you know, a part of just the natural ecosystem of the, of the Sierras, uh, even before um, European settlers arrived, wildfires were a common event. Um, there have been studies that have suggested that before Europeans arrived, um, as much as four and a half million acres were being burned annually uh, in California. Uh, for comparison, you know, last year, 2.6 million acres burned, so like about half of that. Um, and so wildfires are, you know, at some level, part of the ecosystem. Um, and so that's part of what we have to grapple with as we grapple with the health effects of these wildfires is that um, in some ways they're just kind of built into the system. Well, I understand that, and in fact, I've read extensively on that. Uh, George Gruel did, uh, I'm sure you've seen the book Fires in the Sierra Nevadas, where he did it before and after from pictures from the 18, late 1800s, clear up to current, and the, four, and the buildup of fuels is what he pointed out. And that's why I'm getting that, because in the past, when the, whether it was the Indians or the logging community or whatever, the forests were thinned out consistently. The Indians may have done it through fires, which is what we're trying to prevent. The other way you can do it, though, is to simply harvest the surplus timber. 
the photo that you have is probably one of the best examples you can see of a mismanagement of the forest. The thickness of the trees, the age of the trees, that would have never have occurred historically because those would have burned or been burned uh, prior to that. So this is a classic example of for forest mismanagement by the state of California. So anyway, I would love to see somebody do a correlation between the, the harvest and, and fires. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions for members of the committee? Assemblyman Hafen. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I don't sit on the, the Natural Resource Committee, and so maybe you can help me with this question. Um, if my memory serves me correctly. Last session, we passed a resolution to encourage proper forest management. Um, have we ever reached out to our, our neighbors in California and said, hey, this is what we're doing. Could you maybe do something similar to, to, to help prevent um, you know, the issues that we're seeing in northern Nevada, uh, it's, I mean, clearly it's, most of it's coming from there. Um, so I was just curious, in that realm, if that was something that's ever come up, but to, to try and encourage our neighbors to do something similar to, to what we're doing um, and encourage proper uh, forest management. Thank you for that, Assemblyman. Uh, you know, we did have in a previous natural resources meeting a discussion about wildfires. Um, and, and addressing them, and I think there is increasing coordination uh, between uh, local governments, state governments, and at a regional level, uh, both in responding to um, uh, fires when they do break out, and I think uh, you know there is also growing uh, uh, recognition and attempts of the need to work um, collaboratively on some of the prevention efforts as well. So. And, uh, and uh, definitely agree about the uh, historical mismanagement issues. And uh, that's what we're trying to figure out is how we can help remedy some of these things um, now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? All right. Seeing none, thank you again very much for thank the you. presentation, Mr. Kaiser. We appreciate it. All right. Uh, next, we will move on to uh, agenda item number nine, which is an overview of air pollution in Nevada's urban centers and public health implications. Uh, we have representatives from Clark County's Department of Environment and Sustainability and the Washoe County Health District. Um, so I think we'll begin with Clark County and uh, as soon as you uh, have your presentation prepared, you can uh, introduce yourself for the record and begin whenever ready. This is not my presentation, forgive me. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Watts and Chair Peters, for the opportunity to address your committees today. My name is Kevin McDonald with Clark County's Department of Environment and Sustainability. We are the Southern Nevada agency charged to enforce compliance with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's National Ambient Air Quality Standards in our community. We protect the air we share through various initiatives carried out by our Division of Air Quality, including issuance of all air quality permits to the local business community, enforce compliance with all state and federal health-based standards via inspections, and when necessary, issuance of notices of violation which may carry a monetary penalty. Additionally, our department's Office of Sustainability has been tasked with lowering greenhouse gas emissions regionally. To track local air quality, we operate and maintain a network of 18 monitoring stations located throughout Clark, throughout Clark County. These monitoring stations collect data on five of the six criteria pollutants for which we monitor. Particulate matter in two sizes, PM10 and PM2.5, PM2.5 being the smallest, ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide. This data is then reviewed and reported to the public via our monitoring website, where we provide an hour-by-hour -hour air quality index and daily forecasts of local air quality conditions. While we monitor all these criteria pollutants, only two of them remain a primary concern for Clark County, ozone and particulate matter. Let's start by talking about ozone. Most often, we think of ozone as a good thing because stratospheric ozone protects us from the sun's ultraviolet rays. At the ground level, 
Ozone is an odorless, colorless gas that can be harmful to breathe, especially for those with breathing sensitivities such as asthma and COPD. It can also be harmful to children, older adults, and even our pets. To understand the threat of ozone, we must first understand what causes ozone. Ground level ozone formation occurs when volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, think of anything that puts off a fume, fuel, paint, or chemicals, even vegetation, mixed with nitrogen oxides, NOx, which is anything that combusts, such as vehicle engines, industry, fire. Those cook in the sunlight and the UV rays. You need all three of these components, VOCs plus NOx plus sunlight, for ozone formation. Remove one of these components and remove ozone. Ozone remains our number one air quality concern in Clark County for some relatively obvious factors. Our geography, topography, climate, and population. Clark County sits to the west of California, which can transport ozone-producing pollutants into the region. We're also surrounded by mountains, which creates a bowl effect. Add to that the 1.6 million registered vehicles in Clark County, plus the hot summer sun in Las Vegas becomes a perfect oven to cook ozone. That being said, our Division of Air Quality has taken many steps to reduce ozone formation, including stringent parameters in our permitting actions as well as enforced compliance through inspections. The result is an overall decrease in days when ozone concentrations are above 70 parts per billion, the current EPA standard for healthy air. Let me repeat that. The result is an overall decrease in days when ozone concentrations are above the 70 parts per, bill per billion standard. If you look at this chart, you can see an overall downward trend in ozone. This year, while not reflected on that chart, we've only had one ozone uh, exceedance, but it's only halfway through the season. I want to call attention to the years uh, 2017 to 2021 on this chart because it exemplifies another rising challenge we need to address. In four of the five years represented here, 2017, 2018, 2020, and 2021, wildfire smoke influenced about half of the exceedance days we recorded. The one year we had minimal traceable wildfire smoke, 2019, we recorded only three ozone exceedances. We're not suggesting we're not suggesting wildfire smoke is a sole cause, obviously, but wildfire smoke drifting from hundreds of miles away and settling in Clark County has become something of a common occurrence each summer. So common that for the first time this year, we issued a seasonal wildfire smoke advisory from 1 April to 30 September, alongside our seasonal ozone advisory. The wildfire smoke we've been experiencing is a lurking menace against which we are largely powerless because it's coming from neighboring states, sometimes hundreds of miles away. In addition to ozone formation, smoke also contributes to particle pollution. I call your attention to this image taken from one of our visibility cameras atop the M Resort, aimed north toward the Las Vegas Strip. Last August on a hot summer day at 7.45 a.m. So it's a little hazy, as you might expect, but an otherwise normal day in Vegas. Now here's what it looked like just four days prior at the same time, 7.45 a.m. It's the same camera, same angle, and same time of day. What you're looking at here is the impact of wildfire smoke that drifted into Las Vegas beginning the night before. I'm sure you all who live here remember that weekend. It was one of our worst air quality episodes of the year. Every single monitoring station in our network exceeded for PM 2.5. A day when all monitoring stations register exceedances is very, very rare. So the next question we usually hear is, what are you doing about it with regard to wildfire smoke? Sadly, there isn't much we can do. This is one of those times where we as an agency can do everything right, our permitted, our permitted business community can do everything right, and we still record an exceedance for a criteria pollutant. If anything, this underscores the necessity to think and act regionally and globally on air pollution and other climate related factors. Nevertheless, we continue to protect the air we share through a variety of methods, including keeping the public informed as it allows people to make informed decisions on their own health. We continue enforcement of the air permits we issue. We also commissioned a NOAA study to get a better sense of what components are comprising the ozone in Clark County. Once that study is complete, we will share those results with the public. We're also tracking and supporting state and federal action of the transportation sector, such as Clean Cars Nevada. We launched the county's transportation and electrification working group, which strives to electrify Clark County's transportation system. This working group includes Clark County, local municipalities, NV Energy, the Resort Corridor, and several NGOs, all working in collaboration toward a common goal of modernizing the Clark County infrastructure. We're also working toward lowering greenhouse gas emissions and com combating climate change impacts in the region through all in Clark County. 
Our action to make Clark County more sustainable and more resilient. In response to the passage of AB 349 last year, which closed the so-called classic car loophole, we are working toward getting more high polluting vehicles off the road via a repair and replace program. Now, none of that has anything to do with wildfire smoke, I realize, but I do feel it's important to point out that DES is actively working to improve air quality in Clark County on several fronts beyond our usual permitting and enforcement activity. There are steps individuals can take to assist in reducing ozone. The way we operate our vehicles can help reduce ozone, including limiting your vehicle, or limit idling your vehicle unnecessarily, reduce driving and combined trips, use mass transit, fill your gas tank after sunset, and don't use drive throughs instead, turn off your vehicle and, and go inside. Also important, if you have breathing sensitivities, this includes children, older adults, and once again, your pets, you should follow these tips to moderate uh, on moderate or worse air quality days. Reduce outdoor activity, schedule activities in the morning or evening when ozone levels are usually lower, and substitute a less intense activity. It's also important that individuals can help us catch the bad actors who aren't operating within the parameters of their air permits. You can reach our air quality complaint hotline via telephone, email, or internet. Last year, we received more than 1,000 calls and responded to 99.7% of them within 24 hours. We also encourage people to stay informed. You can follow us on social media, go to enviroflash.com to receive daily text or email updates, or download the AirNow app to your phone. It's free and gives you real-time air quality information. To conclude, air quality in Clark County is mostly good, but we have important challenges to address with regard to ozone and particulate matter, as well as the mounting climate change challenges we face. Through combined efforts between the Division of Air Quality and all in Clark County, we are tackling the issues at the root causes on multiple fronts to lower greenhouse gas emissions and other underlying environmental challenges to ensure Clark County thrives and meets its climate change impacts head on for the benefit of generations to come. I thank you for your time and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. We appreciate it. I think given um, uh, you know, the nature of this item and that we also have Washoe County presenting. Uh, I'd like to have them uh, provide their presentation and then we'll open it up for members to ask questions to Clark Washoe or both. So with that, uh, we'll welcome our presenter from Washoe County. Um, whenever you are ready, you can introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Okay, thank you very much. Let me share my screen, pull up the presentation here. Okay, can everybody see my presentation there? Yes, we can, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. For the record, my name is Craig Peterson, and I'm a senior air quality specialist in the planning branch of the Washoe County Health District Air Quality Management Division. Thank you for the opportunity to present information about how climate change is impacting air quality and the health of our community. Let's get straight to the point. Our climate is getting warmer. Temperatures are increasing, and Reno is one of the fastest warming cities in the United States. According to climatecentral.org, Reno's temperature has increased 7.7 .7 degrees Fahrenheit since 1970. That's five degrees more than the national average. Not only are temperatures increasing, but heat episodes are getting longer. Here in Northern Nevada in 2018, we had 56 consecutive days of over 90 degrees. In 2021, we had 10 consecutive days of over 100 degrees. In total, 22 days were over 100 degrees in 2021 setting a new record. Warmer temperatures directly and indirectly increase air pollution and extreme heat is the leading cause of weather-related deaths in the United States. Cooling degree days are a measure of how hot the temperature was on a given day or during a period of days. A degree day takes the average between the high and low temperature for that day and compares it to a standard temperature usually 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The difference between that average and 65 is the number of degree days. As you can see here, cooling degree days has been steadily increasing over the last 60 years since 1960. 
Not only does this chart show increasing temperatures, but also increasing energy burden. Heat waves can be especially challenging for households with high energy burdens, especially those that have difficulty affording the electrical bills to run their air conditioning, but face health risks such as heat stroke if they do not run the AC. Older homes are less energy efficient and may not even have air conditioning. Besides increasing temperatures and increasing energy burden, climate change is affecting air quality. Forests upwind of us in California and Oregon are becoming more vulnerable to disease and fire. Fires and smoke episodes are happening more frequently and they are larger and more intense. In the, sum <coughs> excuse me. In the summer of 2021, smoke from the Dixie and Caldor fires resulted in the worst air quality Reno and Sparks has ever recorded. The increasing energy demand for comfort cooling is resulting in more pollution from power plants and motor vehicles. Vehicle miles traveled is also increasing, which drives up the amount of tailpipe emissions and precursors that are needed in the formation of secondary air pollutants, such as ozone. Here's a graphic showing the health effects of air pollution. PM 2.5 or fine particles are those found in smoke and haze. These particles are so small that they can travel deep into the lungs and even be transferred to the cardiovascular system, causing serious health problems. Numerous scientific studies have linked particle pollution exposure to a variety of problems, including irritation of the airways, coughing, difficulty breathing, decreased lung function, aggravated asthma, irregular heartbeat, non-fatal heart attacks, and premature death in people with heart or lung disease. And then there's ground level ozone. Ozone is created by a chemical reaction between oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds in the presence of sunlight. Breathing ground level ozone can trigger a variety of health problems, including chest pain, coughing, throat irritation, and congestion. It can worsen bronchitis, emphysema, and asthma. Ground level ozone can reduce lung function and inflame the linings of the lungs. Repeated exposure may permanently scar lung tissue. Some populations are more vulnerable to air pollution than others. Sensitive groups, such as children, older adults, and people with underlying heart conditions, including asthma, COPD, heart disease, and diabetes, are the most likely to be affected by particle and ozone pollution exposure. However, even healthy people may experience temporary symptoms from exposure to elevated levels of air pollution. That being said, vulnerable populations are more affected by lower levels of air pollution than healthy adults. AQI stands for Air Quality Index. Think of the AQI as a yardstick that runs from zero to 500. The higher the AQI value, the greater the level of air pollution and the greater the health concern. For example, an AQI value of 50 or below represents good air quality, while an AQI value of over 300 represents hazardous air quality. This chart is summarizing the highest air quality index in 2021 by month. The orange and blue bars are particle pollution, and the blue line is ozone pollution. You can really see how the wildfire smoke over the summer drove the air quality index into the unhealthy, very unhealthy, and almost hazardous ranges. Here's another way to visualize air quality index data for 2021. We can look at the number of days per month the air quality index was in the various categories. Where we used to see our worst air quality in the winter has now shifted to the summer. You can see the greatest number of unhealthy days in 2021 was in July and August. What can you do about high temperatures and poor air quality? Well, in the short term, make sure you listen to your body. If you are experiencing difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, sore throat, chest pain, or fatigue, take precautions. Know the air quality index and weather forecasts. If the temperature is high or the AQI is over 100, reduce outdoor activities or stay inside. Close your windows and doors and run your central air conditioner if you have one. If you have a window mounted AC unit, make sure the vent to the outside is closed and run it in recirculation mode if available. It's best not to run swamp coolers as they can just bring more smoke inside.
You can also purchase indoor air purifiers with HEPA filtration to help clean the air inside your home. In the long term, we urge you to support legislation, codes, and ordinances that support the reduction of urban heat islands and the reduction of motor vehicle emissions. An urban heat island occurs when a city or urban area experience higher temperatures than outlying areas. Structures such as buildings, roads, and other infrastructure absorb and re-emit the sun's heat more than natural landscapes, such as forests and water bodies. Examples of existing plans and programs in our area include Nevada's Climate Initiative, Reno's Sustainability and Climate Action Plan, Reno's Tree Protection Ordinance, and the Governor, excuse me, the Governor's Office of Energy Heroes Program and RTC Washoe's Smart Trips Program. Reno's Sustainability and Climate Action Plan, for example, prioritizes creating lively, low-carbon neighborhoods and healthy, equitable urban forests. Here are a few takeaways from today's presentation. Air pollution and heat episodes are trending upward, becoming more frequent, longer in duration, and more severe. The solutions will require effort from everyone. Support legislation that supports strategies for climate change adaptation, including managing heat risks and improving air quality to protect human health and the environment. Increasing tree canopy coverage will have multiple benefits for all. Support the Reimagine Reno Master Plan, Reno Sustainability and Climate Master Plan, and the, and the Urban Forest, excuse me, and the Urban Forestry Management Plan to increase the tree canopy, maintain a healthy, equitable urban forest, and promote community partnerships. Statewide codes and requirements may be needed for mitigation actions such as green building, transportation, and land use. Thank you again for the opportunity to present information about how climate change is impacting air quality and public health. Thank you very much for your presentation. All right, with that, we will open it up to members uh, who have questions for, again, either of the uh, county air quality <coughs> experts. Chair Peters. Thank you, Chair Watts. Um, my question is related to the decision making as a result of the increased um, pollution from wildfires. So we permit projects, right, based on project emissions that are tolerated in our regions, right? And so how are we using the wildfire data we have to integrate into the decision making for permits from like industrial permits? Um, and, or is it having any impact on how you're um, either assessing the impact to the region or um, uh, reviewing those permits that come in for air, your air program permits? Yes, Kevin McDonald, DES, Clark County. Uh, Chair Peters, to my knowledge, the wildfire smoke hasn't um, changed <laughs> the way we issue permits or the way we write permits. The only change that, I, I, that we've made that I'm aware of is by issuing the seasonal wildfire smoke advisory, which is more or less to provide awareness to the public. But uh, in terms of permits, at least for Clark County, we haven't taken that into consideration yet. And I can pretty much, oh, excuse me, Craig Peterson for the record. Um, I can pretty much uh, just duplicate what Mr. McDonald said. Um, we haven't really changed any way that we permit industry. Um, so yeah, pretty much just uh, public advisories um, to warn people about wildfire smoke and what they can do to uh, stay healthy during wildfire smoke events. Thank you very much. Additional questions from members of the committee? Uh, we've got uh, Senator Hansen. And actually, I believe we have a number of members up north. So uh, we'll do Senator Hansen, Assemblywoman Titus, then Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, obviously, 1.6 million vehicles in Clark County, reducing ozone. Your presentation calls, calls for reducing driving, not idling, not using drive throughs at restaurants and so forth. Uh, the Washoe County guy uh, said similar things about uh, the, the amount of miles, vehicle miles traveled needs to be dr dramatically reduced. Um, 
I think, and then the governor's uh, state climate strategy clearly calls for dramatic reductions in the amount of fossil fuels used in transportation. So add those things up. Isn't it a positive thing that the cost of fuel is now over $6 a gallon? Because as any economist would point out, the higher the cost, the less consumption you'll have. So for purposes of air quality in Nevada, higher gas prices are a net positive and actually fall very well within the state climate strategy. Would, would you agree with that? Mr. Peterson, you're the one on my screen, so we'll start with you. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the gas prices certainly uh, make me want to drive less, that's for sure. Um, what, what we're kind of pushing in our agency is, uh, is smart trips programs for businesses where they can use public transit more, carpooling, van pooling, um, bicycling or walking if you can to work, uh, and telecommuting, flexible work schedules, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, that's kind of what we're pushing for here at, at, at the Air Quality Management Division in Washoe County. Um, really just reducing those vehicle mile traveled, um, and that'll help reduce the, uh, the motor vehicle tailpipe emissions. Very, very good. Mr. McDonald, would you agree with that, that the price of gas going up is actually a net benefit because people will burn less gasoline and uh, less ozone problems in Clark County? Uh, Kevin McDonald, Clark County DES. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. I don't know if I if I want to go on the record one way or the other with that, but I will say that um, yes, it does motivate people to drive less. But the way we've been tackling it currently or in, immediately is we're going to be promoting uh, driving electric because fewer greenhouse gas emissions is a good thing because the, the one of our top polluters in Clark County, and I think the top polluter in the state, is the transportation sector. That being said. We're, our immediate concern with, with uh, reducing tailpipe emissions is closing that classic car uh, loophole. There are 30, about 30,000 vehicles in Clark County that have the classic car or classic vehicle tags registered as classic vehicles, and not all of them are classic vehicles. We're not talking about all 57 T-Birds. Some of them are, are going to be like an 82 Nissan or something that's still on the road. So that's why we're going to be implementing a repair and replace program to help people to, who otherwise may not be able to afford the repairs to their vehicles uh, to help them uh, get that car in check. Well, I would suspect since most people can't afford $6 a gallon gasoline, that that will also greatly help reduce the amount of uh, tailpipe emissions. So it seems to me like the higher the gas prices go, the better it fits in with the state climate strategy that the governor's presented to the state. So thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. And I guess we should all be happy to see $6 an hour or a gallon gas and rising. Now we're going to have less pollution, but our poor people can't afford to drive their cars. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Uh, I believe we have Assemblywoman Titus next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I, I want to start with um, the uh, Washoe County in the north. You mentioned that Reno is one of the fastest warming cities in the United States. Um, we have listened um, for the greater part of this day on the impact that basically humans have on global warming um, and the fact that we are paving and digging up our cities in Reno in particular, digging up trees and we're putting down blacktop. So can you tell me, uh, have you done any studies on the actual, because I know I went to school in Reno, I spent 12 years there for undergrad, med school, residency, et cetera, and it changed dramatically in the number of people that are in Reno. Um, at what was the percent of growth uh, in Reno at the same time we saw this um, warming in Reno? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Craig Peterson. For the record, uh, unfortunately, I don't I don't have that data um, in front of me or even um, at the forefront of my brain here, so I can't give you the actual percentage of growth. Um, I can find that out and get back to you. Right. I really love to see a chart done where, as you saw the temperatures and you showed us the temperatures going up what the population in Reno or the Washoe County area also, and if there was that correlation with that. And the next question I have is you did a picture, um, a, a graph for us on the cooling degree days in Reno, and this is all done at the Reno airport. Do you know what the percent increase in pavement there is at the Reno airport in those that period of time? 
Thank you again for the question. For the record, Craig Peterson, uh, again, I, I'm very sorry I don't have that data with me. Just looking pretty dramatically for me in 1972, 1984, those particular temperatures, I flew in and out of Reno. They're the old prop Hughes airplanes that we used to fly into Reno Airport and we'd get off on the tarmac and walk out right there. And then, then the Reno Airport dramatically changed uh, in the last couple decades. And I'm just wondering if you uh, could correlate that with the size and that change of the temperature readings at that particular airport. I'm sure there's a there's a factor there, but uh, again, I, I think we'd have to research that. Great, Th I'd the, love to see a graph answer. from that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, and I think that also points to uh, some of the comments made by previous presenters as well about uh, expanding the data collection. Um, you know, and it, obviously that uh, requires resources, but. Uh, gathering, uh, you know, uh, heat information, uh, air quality information uh, from across uh, many different locations, as particularly in these urban areas, can, um, I think, help uh, us identify the most affected communities, first of all, but also help um, provide better understanding of some of these trends by getting a little bit more granular. So uh, I believe next we have Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, this Chair. is quite informative. You've, you've been keeping records for quite a while on uh, wildfires, I assume. But about 20 years ago, uh, we flew from Elko, Nevada, and our twin to California. And the wildfires were in California, Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, all over Elko County, and Vegas. We never seen the ground, not once, until we hit the coast. And it seemed like to me the fires then were worse than what they were this last one in California. Uh, is, and you're saying this has been the worst on the record, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, Craig Peterson for the record. Um, so just, just speaking of uh, 2021, the wildfire season in 2021, um, as far as uh, pollutant by pollutant is concerned. So let's just talk about ozone first. Um, we had, uh, well, first of all, we had 71 total days that were impacted by wildfire smoke. Um, we had 26 exceedances of the ozone standard, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. Um, and uh, the highest ozone concentration um, we recorded, and this is an eight hour average, is how they, they calculate the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. Um, but we had an eight hour average of 92 parts per billion, and that's the highest that we've seen in uh, the last 13 years. And then speaking of PM 2.5, uh, these are 24 hour averages. Um, the PM 2.5 National Ambient Air Quality Standard is 35 micrograms per cubic meter, and we saw 241 micrograms per cubic meter. And that's the highest ever recording since we've been monitor, monitoring for PM 2.5 in, uh, we've been monitoring for PM 2.5 for 22 years. And then uh, we can even talk about PM 10, which is a, a larger size particle than PM 2.5, but we had a 24 hour average of 319 micrograms that over doubles the standard of 150 micrograms. And uh, that's the highest ever recorded going back 34 years. So yes, we have been collecting data for a long time. And yes, 2021 was uh, the worst year for air pollution due to wildfire smoke. Okay. Thank you. And uh, for a follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, and we're talking about the electric cars. Everybody's trying to push electric cars, electric cars. But we're seeing more and more states having brownouts. Uh, California is probably the worst uh, with the grid going down quite a bit. So how do you think that's going to affect the electric cars going into the futures with the problems we're having with the uh, overdoing the grid, overpowering the grid, and you're seeing these brownouts or blackouts everywhere? Uh, with, is that question directed at me, sir? Yeah, it, either one of them you can answer it. I mean, oh, okay. it's, it's uh, I mean, we've seen how many uh, 
uh, in California last year went out during air conditioning problems. What's going to do with all electric cars? Either sure. one of you can answer um, that. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I don't think I can speak about the reliability of, of our electric grid here in uh, northern Nevada. Um, I think that may be a question for NV Energy. Uh, I'm not sure exactly um, how they're planning on handling that. So I, I apologize. I don't have that answer either. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, Assemblyman Ellison, I, I do appreciate the question. I do think that uh, perhaps the uh, electric providers and the Public Utilities Commission could speak to that. And, uh, you know, uh, the legislature did pass uh, a major investment in both transmission infrastructure um, and uh, and some charging infrastructure, I think, to help address some of those issues that uh, that you discussed. So I just wanted to make sure all the members of the committee and the public were uh, reminded about that. The, uh, with that, I think we'll move on to Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a question, and I think this one will probably be uh, maybe more appropriate for the gentleman in, in uh, Southern Nevada, please. Um, when we talk about transportation, um, trying to cut back on driving trips, I'm curious since Las Vegas had 42 and a half million tourists visit Las Vegas in 2019, I, I did before COVID. I'm curious if we know, curious you know what kind of an impact and how are we supposed to encourage tourism at the same time trying to cut back on motor vehicle emissions. I know a lot of tourists come by plane, they come by uh, bus, a lot by car. Do we have any understanding of what impact those tourists coming to our state on motor vehicle emissions or airplane emissions, some sort of fossil fuel carrying vehicle is having? Well, like what's the difference between the tourists coming versus those who actually live there? And how is that impacting us? Uh, thank you, Kevin McDonald, uh, Clark County DES. Oh, specific to your question, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, we, going back to the, the 1.6 million registered vehicles, we know we have that many vehicles just from locals in Clark County. Uh, tourism is definitely gonna play an impact on that, but I know that within the transportation sector, RTC, for example, they are uh, using uh, cleaner uh, natural gas buses. And uh, in terms of electrification though, I, want, I do wanna go back to the previous question of electrification, just to touch upon the fact that here in Clark County, that NV Energy is part of the transportation electrification working group so that we can discuss those issues of uh, grid and infrastructure. But uh, in terms of yeah, tourism, I don't have the specific data on how much more or less they provide, but we just, in general, we just know that uh, when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, that trans the transportation sector is one of the, the, the biggest in Clark County. Okay, um, and then just, just to follow up, I, I really just have more of a, an observation. Um, having lived in the Reno Sparks area for you know, 62 years, to me, um, you know, we, we go through waves, we have inversions sometimes, luckily we have wind and it cleans out the air. I find the air quality in, in uh, Northern Nevada to be pretty, pretty darn good and, and, and it seems to be even more clean than when I was a kid or maybe I just didn't pay attention as much as I do now. Um, and, and certainly we have suffered under these forest fires, they have really been um, uncomfortable to live around. but. Historically speaking, again, I think we all are here trying to find solutions. We all are concerned when there is a concern, but sometimes I think we have tunnel vision and we think, oh, we live in the worst of times. We have the worst air. We have the worst temperatures. We can go back to the Dust Bowl of the 30s, high temperatures, bad farming um, methods, coupled with a drought that lasted 10 years and some horrific air quality conditions. Um, um, but that had been followed by a really wet series of years for 20 or 30 years in that area of the country. So um, certainly air pollution is a concern. 
Um, it seems to be cyclical, uh, depending on conditions on the ground. Um, and so anyway, I just wanted to, to uh, get that on the record and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you for that, Assemblywoman Hansen. Uh, that actually does bring something to mind for me as well. And I, I uh, do appreciate your comment that we've made quite a, uh, a bit of impact on some of these issues, uh, you know, air pollution issues um, I've seen before my time uh, and before some of the, the Clean Air Act, for example, um, air pollution in, in urban areas was um, at, at horrific levels. So I think it is worth recognizing the role that uh, some of those policies and that some of our, our state and local entities um, have played in helping to uh, get us into uh, attainment with some of those clean air standards have, have helped. Um, as well as you know, looking at uh, areas that we can continue to make improvements and uh, the potential for some of these uh, environmental factors to potentially move us in the opposite direction, including uh, some of these catastrophic wildfires and um, seeing what we can do to try and uh, reduce the, the pollutants that are coming from those. Uh, any other members of the committee uh, have questions or, or for the Presenters? All right, seeing none, thank you both so much for your presentations today, we appreciate it. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, item number 10, a discussion on climate change and related water issues in Nevada. I believe we have a representative from uh, uh, the Division of Environmental Protection and the Division of Water Resources uh, to discuss um, particularly some of the water quality related issues and the public health related issues. I know for members of the Natural Resources Committee, uh, we, have, uh, we have had a, a couple of discussions about water scarcity um, in general and some of those related issues. So uh, uh, presenters, as soon as you're uh, ready, you can introduce yourselves for the record and begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Watts and uh, members of the committee. My name is Adam Sullivan. I'm the Nevada State Engineer and the Administrator of the Division of Water Resources. And w Greg Lovato is the Administrator of Division of Environmental Protection. We'll be splitting this. Um, and I'll give the first portion on water quantity, and Greg will give the second portion focused on water quality. To start with, so, go back. to start with, it, it, so the the agenda item is climate change and related water issues, and I wanted to s discuss s some basic data and the the overall consensus on observed trends and future projections related to water, uh, because we've been talking really about temperature, and there's clear projections on temperature increases over time. It's not so with when you look at the total amount of precipitation on a on an average annual basis. With the higher temperatures, there's, there's the, the response of getting more precipitation falling as rain than as snow. Uh, the earlier runoff from the, the uh, you know, peak runoff in the spring is, is trending earlier. Uh, it leads to a longer growing season and increased evaporative, evaporative demand over, the, over an average season. And also there's the trend observed and the projection towards greater extremes, that is longer drought periods, more severe or higher magnitude flood events. And these are all things that have a really important impacts on water supply and water management, um, specifically with reduction in the, the snowpack, reser snowpack reservoir in the mountains less surface water availability later in the season, which leads to increased reliance on groundwater. The current drought that we're in, that we're in now highlights some of the problems that we anticipate experiencing more in the long term. Here we're showing the current drought monitor, which is a commonly used display of drought conditions where the darker colors rec rec represent more severe 
drought. And it's, it's showing that the southern Nevada is, currently is in worse condition than in the north. Uh, but really, the entire state has been in really dry conditions for the last two to three years. So again, the trends observed during this drought uh, that we've been responsive to are indicative of what we should anticipate in the longer term with regard to extremes. So this drought was really remarkable in how quickly it came on. It came on. You'll recall that 2017 and 2019 were, were really record-setting wet years. And by 2021, we were seeing record dry soil conditions. Um, it's, similarly, in this past water year, we had huge events in October and then again in December. Um, but that was all we got for the rest of the year. And so um, we're still in this deficit, even though we had these record-setting wet individual events. So this is a chart that shows the uh, main reservoirs serving Nevada with current storage and percent capacity compared to last year. And now each of these reservoirs are, are uniquely managed for different needs. But what's, one of the things that's notable here is that the conditions we're in right now this year, actually this is a couple of months ago, but conditions this year are very similar to last year, which is indicative of good management of a limited supply. Uh, reservoir storage can, can generally is recovers really rapidly in just one big year. Um, where, where there is a concern with reservoir storage are, um, are 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 those reservoirs that are subject to cumulative long-term effects in the, in the contributing upper watershed, um, and and are therefore less resilient to drought. And Lake Mead is a prime example of this, being really low in the Colorado River system. Uh, Rye Patch Reservoir is another example of this, also being low in the, in the Humboldt River watershed. W with regard to public health, um, drinking water for our largest population centers is provided by surface water sources. So that's including several of the reservoirs listed here, um, is serving Las Vegas, Reno, Sparks, Carson City, all of which have excellent planning measures in place managing surface water. Um, most of the rest of the state re is reliant on groundwater wells for meeting drinking water needs. And so with the next slide, I want to discuss that. This demonstrates a trend that's common around the state. These are typical groundwater level hydrographs for Grass Valley on the upper chart, and then in, which is near Winnemucca and in Pahrump, in Nye County. It, both are showing an average of about one foot of decline per year with limited recharge in during those wet years. So we're looking at the long-term declining trend. And really what we look for in these, in these long-term trends is some stabilization, flattening of that curve after a long time, indicating some reaching some equilibrium state where you can support that groundwater pumping but you don't have that continued decline. Now with the, with the long-term projections, um, including longer growing seasons, higher consumptive use, and just overall increase in the demand for water, uh, the risk is that it, th that would cause an increase in the rate of decline in locations such as this, even to meet the current uses that are, that are supplied by groundwater. So a long-term reliable water supply is critical for health and safety, for energy supply, for to grow food, and to protect the environment. With a less reliable surface water um, supply, it leads to a greater reliance on groundwater, which then leads to greater potential for decline. M municipal wells are generally pretty deep, well-maintained, and closely monitored and therefore more resilient. And similarly with large irrigation wells tend to be deeper. Um, and the amount of drawdown that we, that we often observe is not an immediate threat to actually being able to get water. Uh, it's that continued rate of decline that in projecting that into the future where um, the concern lies. More vulnerable areas in the shorter term are often those areas that are reliant on domestic wells 
Domestic just domestic wells just tend to be shallower. Um, they aren't um, necessarily maintained as frequently or, or relied on for longer period. You know, they're older. Um, it, and the figure shown here is just a, um, d demonstrates the relative density of domestic wells around the state. So. Um, Recommendations for how to reduce impacts of climate change on water resources is one of the items that was put forth in a recent report on um, called the Climate Change in Nevada, which was um, a joint, jointly authored report by the state climatologist, UNR and DRI, and the Scripps Institute. And I'm, I'm referring to this because among the recommendations that they came up with were maintenance of infrastructure to accommodate extremes, um, considering options to hold water in basins or higher up in the watershed for longer um, and to fill monitoring gaps and, and con continue putting that data that's collected to good use. Uh, it, from my perspective in a, in a regulatory role, this is, this is consistent with supporting programs such as aquifer storage and recovery where there's potential to do that. It's also, it, to me, it means really communicating with, with water right holders and uh, being able to be adaptable within the confines of water law to accommodate various local measures that protect the resource. Um, one last observation is that our division in updating the state water plan um, has solicited public input on priorities with regard to state water management and to, uh, over 1,200 people replied to a public survey, and one of the open-ended questions was about future management priorities. And the top issues that came out of that survey were, number one, emphasizing water conservation and efficiency, and number two, controlling growth within the realistic limits of the, of the water supply. So that's valuable public input. And I'll conclude with, uh, two final recommendations on this on this topic which are um, to support um, to support updated water budget science this is something that our division has been uh, has been talking about a lot um, and, and it's something that I think the state needs to, to really provide a critical uh, understand the baseline for water availability and then secondly um, supporting infrastructure enhancements um, especially for dam safety and, and flood management measures and with that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Chair Watts, Chair Peters, members of the committee. Uh, Greg Lovato, Administrator of the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection. Uh, NDP was asked by LCB on behalf of the committee uh, to present our perspective on potential impacts of climate change on water quality and how that could affect human health in Nevada. And we appreciate the opportunity to, to appear before you today. Uh, NDP functions primarily as a regulatory pollution control agency and, and not a scientific research organization. But we do do our best to stay aware of emerging issues and keep them on our radar in anticipation of how they may affect the state of Nevada's environment and what they may mean for our day-to-day -day work. Uh, in that spirit, we have reviewed portions of uh, comprehensive government-compiled uh, pu climate publications. Uh, specifically, two publications by the U.S. Government Global Change Research Program. These include the Southwest U.S. Chapter of the 2018 Fourth National Climate Assessment, Assessment and the Climate Impacts on Water-Related Illness and Human Health Chapters of the 2016 Climate Change Scientific Assessment. So these documents comprise official government summaries of climate change literature. Uh, they include passages on anticipated impacts of climate change on water quality and human health, and they are the basis for the information I'm presenting before you today. So as Adam mentioned, all things being equal, uh, climate change is expected to change precipitation patterns in Nevada and throughout the Southwest US region by shifting more precipitation to fall as rain instead of snow, decreasing availability of surface water sources and making them available during different windows of time. Uh, this shift in precipitation is expected to increase our overall reliance on groundwater sources. Uh, that would basically increase the importance and value of our existing groundwater quality protection programs. Uh, these include our safe drinking water program requirements for public water systems, uh, which in the event of pursuing additional sources may require additional treatment, 
of groundwater sources that have not been developed uh, may require treatment for common uh, occurring co contaminants throughout Nevada, such as arsenic nitrates, in order to protect public health. Uh, we would also expect this increased reliance on groundwater resources to increase the need for local communities and water providers uh, to revisit and update uh, their source water, source water assessments or complete them if they have not done so already. Uh, what we're talking about here is uh, vulnerability assessments in terms of uh, groundwater sources that may be vulnerable to potentially contaminating activities. Uh, in accordance with the Safe Drinking Water Act and federal funding, uh, NDEP has provided voluntary technical assistance resources for communities to create these assessments uh, since 2012, uh, which can be used uh, voluntarily to help guide local land use and other decisions that may be needed to protect water sources. Um, again, our existing programs for protecting groundwater and cleaning up groundwater, including stormwater controls, uh, cleanup programs such as the Truckee Meadows Remediation District administered by Washoe County and overseen by NDEP, and all the groundwater cleanups overseen by NDEP across the state will become even more important. Uh, changing precipitation patterns under climate change are anticipated to increase the intensity of rainstorms, causing additional erosion, runoff, and introduction, introduction of pollution from non-point sources into surface water bodies. Uh, these may include sediment, nutrients, microplastics, and other contaminants. Uh, this anticipated increase in loading of these pollutants from more intense rainstorms to surface water bodies will place additional priority on our efforts to support and improve what we call best management practices to control and reduce pollution from non-point sources. Uh, with the exception of municipal stormwater and specific water bodies with requirements like Lake Tahoe, uh, non-point source pollution is not regulated like discharges from the end of a pipe. We rely on technical assistance and water quality improvement projects such as stream stabilization to address non-point source pollution. There may be an increased reliance on treatment to render surface water sources safe for human consumption in order to protect human health. Temperature increases can drive increased and longer duration stratification in lakes, including Lake Tahoe, which reduces mixing and can increase potential for water quality concerns, including harmful algal blooms. Uh, during, hearing, during hearings on Assembly Bill 146, sponsored by Assemblywoman Peters during the 2021 session, NDEP noted that we plan to update our technical resources manual for best management practices uh, to reduce non-point source pollution. Our water quality planning staff has been at work assembling a broadly based and representative technical advisory committee to update the manual, and the committee held its first meeting this past week. Uh, we anticipate bringing the updated manual before the State Environmental Commission and State Conservation Commission in the first part of 2023. According to research we reviewed, climate change is anticipated to change when, how long, and where harmful algal blooms may occur in freshwater environments. Harmful algal blooms can be harmful to animal and human health and already occur throughout the U.S., including Nevada. It is not clear based on the research that I reviewed whether there will be an overall increase in harmful algal blooms and potential harm to human health, but it may change where and when and how long they occur. NDEP collaborates with our partners at DHHS, the Department of Agriculture, and NDOW when we become aware of harmful algal blooms and we work together to post signs to protect human and animal health. Climate change could change where we need to monitor for harm harmful algal blooms as they may occur in places, times, or locations they have not occurred in the past. So I, I think what I take away from uh, the review is that our existing programs uh, need to be sustained, possibly strengthened, um, in order to prepare for potential changes in the future. And uh, with that, uh, we'd be happy to take any questions from the committee. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Lovato, for your presentations, we appreciate it. And uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions from members. We'll start with Chair Peters. Thank you, Chair Watts. Um, I have two, I, I'm thinking, brief questions. Um, the first one is directed to State Engineer. Um, how are, well, I guess both of you, really, because you're both the regulatory agencies on this, but how do you guys work together when there is a water right or a water use change and request? and the water quality standards have to meet a specific standard like the drinking water standard. How do you guys work together on that? 
I, I, it's like a chicken egg thing, right? Like the water rights have to come first, but you, and you have to know how much quantity you need, but also the water quality matters for how the treatment process will work and what the cost of the, of the facility will be. And I guess I'm kind of, I'm, I'm thinking through how are we using these, um, the state revolving loan fund to establish new water treatment facilities um, or increase the treatment requirement for those facilities? And just like, how do you guys integrate the kind of the crossover of how people access drinking water in the state of Nevada? Adam Sullivan, for the record, thank you for the question. Assemblywoman Peters, um, so you you're, you bring up a good point that there's there's specific requirements that a, a provider would have to to meet that are either in the under the jurisdiction of um, Division of Water Resources or Division of Environmental Protection or other entities. And as a as a as a department, we try to work cooperatively, and um, we meet regularly. Um, to make sure we understand what's being proposed. Um, and um, we've increasingly we've been able to streamline the permitting process so that there will be some cross-referencing so that we, that we stay within the, 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 the boundaries of water law. But we also try to make this um, um, as functional as we can for the people who are trying to navigate these requirements and and just serve their customers. So it's an ongoing effort, um, but I, I appreciate you thinking along those lines. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman Peters. Um, I would say a good example of how the process works is related to review of new subdivisions where, um, where a subdivision is expanding, um, there's a a process for making sure that there's available water as well as that there's capacity for um, treatment of water if needed and treatment of sewage if needed and so um, there's there's a preliminary plan process and a final plan process and um, those are those are processes that uh, we need to communicate on routinely um, especially if plans change or are abandoned but um, so there's there's an integrated process for making sure that um, you know, we aren't uh, issuing um, permits uh, where rotter rights don't exist and uh, that we have adequate um, treatment capacity in place for drinking water or wastewater that may result from a new subdivision. Uh, thank you for that. Is there um, is that a, f a formalized process? Like, is it in the um, administrative code or the revised statute, or is that a, um, a an internal process that you guys have developed um, as as colleagues under the department? Thank you, uh, Assemblyman Peters, Greg Lovato, for the record. So, um, having not grown up in the uh, water programs, I don't. I'm not able to cite the the section of NAC, but um, yeah, it's it's there's a subdivision um, development requirement. Um, it's somewhere in the 200s of NRS uh, that all of, of us follow and that all of us have a role in. And I we can we can follow up on the specifics with that to you later. Thank you. I would appreciate it. And I'd also appreciate um, maybe a connection or tie into the state revolving loan fund and how that plays a part or a role in this, your decision making processes and, and um, priorities. Thank you again, Greg Lovato for the record. And so the state revolving fund um, I'm becoming more and more familiar with as we understand there's going to be um, quite a bit more federal funding coming in over the next five years that we've been planning for. And, you know, that program has um, a lot of outreach to um, a number of uh, water and wastewater treatment systems throughout the state. Um, they create um, a priority list um, every year that's actually posted on our website if you want to review that. Um, a list of all the projects they've created um, over the years and or helped fund um, over the years are, are on our website. We also fund um, some pretty innovative uh, financing programs uh, for states, not just project, projects that allow them to, um, you know, uh, 
increase the value of, of, of the funds they do have. And um, so, yeah, there's, there's a process ongoing for uh, reaching out to uh, large and small systems throughout the state to get them on the priority list and to uh, have them heard uh, for approval before the board to review claims uh, that meets pretty regularly uh, where that's needed or to approve those projects. Um, we've increased the amount of uh, cash available based on a, a cash flow model that we changed about three or four years ago, uh, but we've um, maintained our uh, very high bond rating due to solid management of the program. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe we'll go to Assemblywoman Titus now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. And gentlemen, good to see you here. Um, lots happening today in the state of Nevada. They just, the Supreme Court gave that announcement today on that Diamond Valley uh, decision. So I know um, state engineer, you'll be interested in reading that. I'm sure that'll be your nighttime reading today. Um, in any case, uh, my question is on the, um, the, the chart that you gave us in that surface water reservoir levels um, from February 28th. Uh, and looking at um, Topaz Lake, which is my backyard, and um, the, the lakes that you can control, like Boca and, um, and I think Stampede and all of those, which are the water for northern Nevada. This was done from February 28th. Is there a new measurement and a percent from that big water? You mentioned these extreme water things that were had this year. We had like three big episodes. We did have one in May that actually had more moisture in it, I believe, than we had all of January, February, and March. And I was wondering if this changed, if that capacity, and if so, where can I go to find that? What, what, what website would I do? Did you update this chart after that? Because Nevada, yeah. you know, the, the, there's extremes, and that's what we see all the time here. So and then you get these averages. So, um, But this is before that big event. Right. Adam Sullivan, for the record, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Titus. The, um, the source for that is actually the, the NRCS. Um, the, in, in Reno, they do, they do a really good job of updating that data and um, co um, compiling it statewide. Do you know how often they collect that, sir? Generally, they, they try to update that on a monthly basis. Okay, good. So hopefully we can see if that really made a change. Because I think right. what I'm seeing here, and, and I'd like to see something like even past a, a last year capacity, like you know three years ago capacity, those kind of things on any particular day, because these are controlled levels in these particular reservoirs. So it's not like it's a a natural occurring that you could get a good feel on really the, where the water is, because that, that water level is controlled. The Topaz Lake is, Chimney Creek Reservoir is, Donner Lake is, um, Boca, all of those are controlled where those levels are. So I'm just curious to see, um, is, that's, an, uh, that's a decision to hold that water there. Um, and then let some out like Lahontan is. And I know that there's no upstream. One of the big issues with the Carson Valley and the Carson River system is there's no upstream place to hold that prior to getting to Lahontan. So I'm just curious about the amount of flow versus the, the um, just, just those kind of capacity. And those are, that kind of information is just kind of a one-point information as opposed to the broad information. So interested to see what, what it is now. Yeah, absolutely. This is just one snapshot in time, and to really understand the system, like you point out, they're all really different. It's a managed system, and there's good gauging from both the operators of these reservoirs as, as well as the USGS for stream flows, the NRCS again, um, and other local entities. And if I might just add one little on a personal note, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about since you were down in our valley just a couple months ago, giving us the bad news story. I'd be curious to hear if that has changed and um, where you are on curtailment and some of those things, especially after reading this um, release from the Supreme Court today. So thank you, sir. Looking forward to further conversation. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure we're all looking forward to uh, some additional conversations uh, based on that. Uh, do other members of the committee have questions for either Mr. Lovato or, or uh, Mr. Sullivan? Senator Hansen, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. I knew you couldn't miss me. Uh, quick question, Adam. We just had a presentation from you at public lands meeting, and in it they talked about the different models. Several of the people presenting it, I can't remember if you guys did or not, mentioned that so many of the models predict increased precipitation uh, because of the climate changes that we're experiencing. Um, 
where are you guys on that? Are you guys going to say it's going to stay arid, or are you guys saying that the possibility is temperature rises, precipitation ra rates rise as well? Adam Sullivan, for the record. It, it, that's right. The, the global circulation models that, that try to characterize future precipitation patterns um, don't have a consensus towards whether precipitation would increase slightly, whether it would decrease slightly, or it would stay about the same. It, there wouldn't, it, my understanding, and this, I won't say this is my area of expertise, but um, there isn't a, any prediction that, that precipitation amounts would dramatically change in any direction, up or down. Um, that, therefore, the, you know, the, the central tendency towards all these, these forecasts is that uh, makes sense to plan on um, mean annual precipitation not having any substantial changes over a long period of time, and the and it, it's will get much more bang for the buck on um, preparing for higher extremes um, and uh, more interannual variability. Okay, well, that's actually a positive thing. I, you get the impression listening to this that you know we're in this horrible drought and where uh, all our streams are drying up and the whole state's going to just blow away. Uh, when in fact, what you're saying is it w the averages may change a little bit, but overall, we can kind of predict the me mean uh, flows or whatever will be fairly consistent. Did I understand you correctly? Yeah, that's a fair characterization as far, as far as the mean annual precip over a long period of time. Good. Okay. One other quick question. I don't know if you've uh, – water history. We have, because of these issues, I've dug into it extensively for quite a while. Um, starting with the first historical record I, I know of is when uh, Fremont came and found Pyramid Lake. But he also – at that time, there was no Winnemucca Lake. Winnemucca Lake was actually dry as bone. Um, Winnemucca Lake filled up in the 1860s, and from 1860-something to about 1910, we had a series of very wet winters, which we, end, we based the Newlands Project off those project, projections for the flows on the Truckee, Carson, and so forth. Um, since then, though, we've had a consistent downward trend. I'm just wondering, is it possible that we actually have been in a, a wetter than normal pattern for a century or more, and now we're getting back into more a normal one? As would it be indicated, obviously, the Truckee River didn't flow enough to overflow Pyramid Lake to refill Winnemucca Lake back in the 1840s. Are we returning to perhaps a drier climate that would be a natural change, returning to a natural, drier environment? That obviously was here in the 1840s. Adam Sullivan, for the record, those are some interesting observations. It, that historical climatology is not my area of expertise. Okay, well, I thought I'd throw it out there for fun anyway. It would be very interesting for you as a state engineer to dig into that, because obviously long-term trends are what we're looking at. I mean, if we can in fact show that Nevada's been in a very severe drought window for a long, long time, then our concerns over current levels of drought may be um, exaggerated. We're simply going back into what the norm was for the state. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hansen. And uh, I think one of the uh, important things that we want to do is make sure that, uh, kind of regardless of the long-term trends, that we make sure that, you know, people still have access to water. And, uh, you know, if, if some of these trends continue or, or worsen, even if they bump up down the road um, that could be lead to some pretty severe impacts for for all of our constituents um, and and for all Nevadans uh, in the short term um, as well as potentially in the long term uh, other questions for members of the committee no all right so uh, Thank you both for your uh, time and presentations to the committee today. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, the next item, which, uh, again, we're going to change the uh, uh, order of presentations on our agenda to make sure we can accommodate all of our presenters today. So we will now move on to agenda item number 12, looking at uh, the impacts of climate change on mental health and well-being. And we have a presenter from the Mallory Behavioral Health Crisis Center at Carson Tahoe Health. Um, welcome uh, to the Joint Natural Resources and Health and Human Services Committees. Uh, whenever you're ready, you can introduce yourself for the record and begin. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, my, I'm really here today in my role as the chair of the American Psychiatric Association Climate Committee and a founding member of the Climate Psychiatry Alliance, which is a group of related of psychiatrists interested in the mental health impacts of climate change and raising awareness about them. Um, I'm gonna share a screen just a little bit as I talk so that you can have a chance to look at just a little bit of data. Um, so I'm going to do that now. Um, can you guys see me reasonably well? We can see the presentation. It's not in full screen yet. Okay. There we so, go. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, you know, I think that one of the things to be aware of is the number of people that are experiencing climate related anxiety in this country. Um, and this is from the Yale Center for Climate Communication, um, a poll from September and then published in November of the rates of anxiety about climate change. Um, overall, in both America and in young Americans, um, about 70% of the public expresses significant anxiety about climate change and about 35% express very severe anxiety or worry about climate change. So what you guys are doing here in addressing uh, the needs that people have and acting on the information that we have is just extraordinarily important. Um, a lot of the reason for this anxiety is something that we call in psychiatry disavowal. Um, and disavowal is one of the most pathological defenses. It's the state of acting as if you don't know something that is bad that is going on um, and pretending that it's not happening. The easiest to understand analogy is the analogy in a family where there is ongoing, for example, sexual abuse or physical abuse, which is brought to the attention of the non-abusing parent and the parent does nothing. And there's then this great suppression of the truth in the family, which leads to a lot of trauma related symptoms um, in the person that is experiencing the abuse. And that's actually the best analogy to understand disavowal when we know something and we don't act effectively on it. So I think just from my perspective, um, effective action uh, to solve the problem is most important. I know you guys have had a number of presentations on air pollution, um, but I am going to talk a little bit about uh, particulate air pollution and ozone and how it affects the brain. Um, so this is a slide that highlights in white uh, the most significant. Thank you, Ms. Haas. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, could you just speak up a little bit louder? Uh, a couple of our committee members are having trouble hearing you. Yeah, so this, this slide shows the most. Is that better? A little better? Yes, thank you. Um, this slide shows the most common kinds of air pollution that we have in, uh, in Nevada. About 87% of it is carbon dioxide and other fossil fuel related uh, air particles that have names like PM 2.5 and PM 10. We also have nitric dioxide, a lot of uh, air pollution from pollen and fire smoke, as we know. And then in the Vegas area, we have ground ozone, which is produced when temperatures are particularly high. Um, and those are the ones that we're most focused on in psychiatry. Um, air pollution has been associated with a very wide range of disorders across the lifespan. So uh, starting in studies in Mexico City, children who are raised with air pollution, so Alzheimer type changes in their brains as early as age five. And in studies uh, that were done near coal plants or near highways where kids live near lots of traffic related air pollution, um, there's a very clear incidence increase in uh, ADD and learning disorders and behavior problems in kids. So we have both cognitive and behavioral disorders, but also fairly significant uh, risk in autism, which carries a very long, uh, long-term impact uh, in terms of healthcare needs. Um, air pollution is associated with an increase in depression about uh, of about. 10% after an air pollution event, which is defined as three days, and an increase in suicidality uh, presentations to the ER for suicide of about 1% for every one day of bad air exposure. Some studies looking at bipolar disorder and psychosis as well, although that information is pretty new. But I think the most important thing to understand about air pollution is its impact on the older brain, particularly for women. 
and particularly for women who carry the ApoE4 uh, risk factor allele for Alzheimer's disease. So in the, in the older population, the risk of Alzheimer's disease overall is over threefold higher when you're exposed to the top 25% worse air. And each of those cases is carrying a cost of about $350,000 over the person's lifespan. So doing things about air pollution uh, is the most effective way to reduce the impacts of climate change from my perspective. The other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about because heat and air pollution are our two biggest problems in Nevada in terms of the mental health impacts of climate change are uh, the effects of heat on the brain. Um, you know, overall, we have just increased heat morbidity, heat mortality, heat-related illness, which causes, uh, uh, which contributes significantly to strokes and heart attacks. And it's important to, to know that, as you've probably seen in your relatives when they have a stroke or a heart attack, the incidence of a major depressive disorder episode after a heart attack and after a stroke is about 60%. Um, so there's significant depression coming out of the medical risks of heat. Overall in the population, if you look at Facebook posts or Twitter posts or the kinds of social media data, the population feels more negative when it is hot out. And that can actually be a significant contributor to community well-being. And then there are some small studies that suggest an increase in psychotic symptoms and mania and depression. Um, but the two most important impacts of air pollution for mental health have to do with increases in violence and in suicide rates. Um, so this data is from one of many studies, um, but from Marshall Burke, who's at Stanford, looking at changes in rates of suicide in over a million people in Mexico and the United States where the, you see the crossover part of the bar in the middle is a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And for every one degree over the monthly norms, in addition to that, uh, there's about a 1% increase in, in completed suicide, particularly as you get towards uncomfortable temperatures. And they estimated in this study that uh, the higher temperatures that we're seeing now over 95 degrees will wipe out the uh, gains of every single suicide prevention program that we have in this country by 2050. Um, so very, very significant increase on rates of suicide and very significant increase in rates of violence. So this is a meta-analysis by Solomon Hussain looking at multiple studies of multiple different kinds of violence. And it is true for both group on group and individual violence that the hotter it is outside, the hotter headed we get and the more uh, likely we are to be aggressive with each other. Um, and this has very significant social ramifications just in terms of the number of expected rapes and homicides, assaults and so on that are associated with these very high temperatures. Um, so I think that's a, a very important thing to keep in mind. And this is a breakdown of the same study uh, looking at the uh, percentage increase in the different kinds of violence um, as we have one standard deviation increase in temperature. Um, and the prediction is that there will be about an additional 22,000 murders, 1.2 million aggravated assaults, 180,000 rapes, and 2.3 million simple assaults by the end of this century uh, with unchecked climate change. Um, so I think uh, thinking about ways to uh, mitigate violence when it is hot out is going to be an important part of our response. Um, the third area where climate change has an impact on mental health has to do with food insecurity and the different ways that crops grow. Um, when kids don't have enough to eat, when people don't have enough to eat in general, their academic and cognitive performance and development suffer. Uh, they develop poor attention and more behavioral problems. And there's a kind of linear relationship, the hungrier you are, the more you're likely to have pain, worry, and sadness. Um, when foods go quickly, they also absorb less micronutrients and minerals. And in particular for mental health, zinc and iron are very important. The zinc is very important cofactor in neurotransmitter uh, production so that low zinc is associated with depression and iron is associated with the number of psychiatric disorders, depression and manic depression being the two most significant. Um, but in conclusion, what I would say is that the main mental health effects of climate change really have to do 
with the intersecting stresses that come from the multiple hits of climate change on extreme weather events, on heat, on work productivity, um, and all the other things that, that take a hit. You know, this week we had thousands of flights canceled. We have 100 million Americans in actually life ending heat without air conditioning. Just all these things lead to disability and family strain. And once communities and families start to fall apart, um, rates of substance abuse and child abuse and other things go up. So it's really about the intersecting effects of climate change on the total psyche that, that climate change is having the most effect on people. Um, and this will obviously fall most significantly on disadvantaged populations, particularly the mentally ill. So for example, in heat waves, the mentally ill are, are three to 12 times more likely to die just because they're just not as well resourced as other groups. Um, and I did forget to mention actually that heat is associated with problems with psychiatric medications, uh, which uh, make you less tolerant of heat and therefore um, more likely to uh, end up in the emergency room because you're overheated. So that was what I wanted to say quite briefly, and I can now make myself available for any interest and questions that you have. I am going to share with the group a number of documents. There was a study recently done by Oregon State looking at how they can empower their youth in terms of climate change or climate distress, which I'll share. And there was also a document prepared by my group looking at a state emotional response to extreme weather uh, that can as a draft legislation for a Massachusetts legislature that you might be interested in looking at in terms of what you could do. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haas, for, for uh, sharing that information with us. Uh, you know, uh, again, it's, it's interesting to see how some of um, these uh, issues have a significant intersection with public health. Um, you know, one of the things that I find interesting, uh, particularly about some of the, the mental health issues, is that um, you know, we can also connect them back to um, education, which is kind of a, the other large issue uh, that the legislature deals with. And, you, you know, you talked about some of the potential impacts to, um, uh, to uh, suicide. And, uh, you know, I also wonder about um, the impacts that, you know, if children are, are being exposed to excessive heat, you know, either at home due to lack of adequate uh, air conditioning um, uh, outside or, or in the classroom as well, because I know that Many schools have uh, trouble at times uh, keeping keeping um, their their buildings uh, properly cooled, and the the impacts that that can have on um, on student performance um, and and learning. So, uh, very interesting to think about you know, some of the potential crossover between some of these issues. Uh, do we have uh, questions from members of the committee? And we'll start with Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the presentation. Sorry I missed part of that. I needed to get some caffeine um, to help maintain my alertness through these, uh, this long afternoon, so I apologize. I am interested in your extreme temperatures and suicide rate increases and wondering if there's been um, interesting, interesting data there. Um, wondering if there's been any change in that with, this, as we know, the increased rate of suicide during the COVID pandemic. Um, whether or not that was because people had to be indoors or if there was any effect and if you've done any correlation with the increased suicide rate with, with COVID uh, and not just temperatures, what else was playing a factor there? Was there any correlating factors? I don't think that's been looked at. I can tell you that the rates of depression um, and uh, cognitive disorders went down in China when they were on lockdown from COVID um, because of drops in nitric dioxide, which is uh, an air pollution factor that, that the control of it really can make a significant difference. So oh, good, I, good. nobody's looked specific. Do, what resource did you have with that one on the decrease in depression in China? I'd, I'd love to see that. If you could just send it to the committee or send it to me, I'd love to see that one. Um, but again, the, the, we know the increased drugs, increased suicide um, with the COVID impact. I was just wondering if that the same rate of increase in temperatures did we see with, with COVID? Or was this a dramatic increase? And, 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 and if you could correlate any of that. But thank you for your presentation. Yeah, just to say that, you know, all of these are sort of 1% kind of factors. And when you're thinking about 1% here, 1% there, it may not be the factor that causes something, but it can be a contributing factor that's important. 
Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Assemblywoman Titus. You know, again, I think this just gets back to highlighting how much additional research and, and data that is needed. So some of these things are helping uh, raise issues that uh, I think uh, should be, uh, I think many of us could agree, should be looked into further in order to uh, try and better understand them and then, uh, you know, potentially address them. Questions from other members of the committee? Chair Peters. Thank you, Chair Watson. Thank you, Dr. Haas. I appreciate your presentation in this issue area. Um, and 1% um, may feel small, but the person who's impacted as that 1% or the people who are impacted as that 1% and the feelings within their families and their friends and the ramifications of that 1% being affected can be huge in our community and result in greater impact. So I think it's important, regardless of the percentage, that we um, consider these, these you know, things we can control. Um, my question, though, kind of, kind of goes back to a question I had earlier in the day about um, a presentation from DRI where they um, correlated some spikes in COVID um, positivity rates at a hospital with wildfire season. And you may not have the information today, but I'm, I'm putting this out here, out there to the folks in the public health realm as were we seeing more people going to the hospital for mental and behavioral health needs? Were we seeing more people go to the hospital um, for respite from wildfire? Were we, like, what, was it wildfire that was driving people to the hospital? Or was it COVID driving people to the hospital? And how much was that a factor in seeing those increases in population in the hospital that were positive for COVID in that first 20 year of 2020? So I guess the correlation did not hold in 2021. So anyways, I'm curious from the public health perspective, where are there some areas where we're seeing the real impact of wildfire on our populations and what is it that they're asking for and where can we, par we start moving services and engaging with the populations early. I think that in most of the studies, it's a one to three day lag before somebody comes in with that kind of effect. Um, and so it may not be on the day of the fire. Um, these things do tend to be additive. And so for example, there's increased rates of psychosis and premature birth um, when exposed to heat. And when you have another one patient in labor who's psychotic, who would not otherwise be psychotic, delivering prematurely, would not otherwise be delivering prematurely, one patient in with a stroke, another patient in with a suicide attempt, and two patients in with violence, which is where those 1% end up going. Then you have a hospital that's got 10 more uh, patients that are really in much more severe circumstances, and that hospital begins to be strained. Um, but in terms of wildfire in particular, the, the basic mechanism of all of these things has to do with inflaming the body. So when the tissues are inflamed, whether it's the lung or the brain, uh, they are they are more porous, they're more boggy, um, and, and they therefore are more vulnerable to infection in the same way that when you have broken down skin, uh, you're more vulnerable to getting an infection at that site. Um, so the COVID wildfire thing, I think, works a little bit like that. Um, and again, most of these studies were not done in Nevada, so I wouldn't be able to speak specifically to rates of ER admission in Nevada. They've been done in places like Seoul, Korea, uh, Beijing, uh, you know, places like that. Thank you, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm echoing uh, some of the uh, requests from other members to, uh, if you uh, have the ability to share some of those uh, studies um, for uh, or links to them so that folks can check them out, we'd, we'd appreciate that. Uh, I believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Hansen, and don't worry, I have you, I've, I've got you down next, Senator Hansen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have, uh, just, just first off, uh, appreciate you being here and taking our questions. Um, I have a son who's a doctor, three of my four daughters are nurses. I have not heard of one single, uh, you know, we, we talk, with respect to HIPAA, though, um, about what they see in the course of their work, especially my son was the co-head of a COVID unit, I don't recall one single climate-related uh, situation in the, the work that they've done. But I do have a daughter that is a mental health professional. Um, and the discussion about some of the issues of depression, anxiety, that um, she's been able to share in a general sense and what my question would be for you is, what is the impact of social media more so 
when we talk about climate is that I, I think about the young people, and this is what my daughter has talked about. Young people are impacted greatly by social media. And a lot of the climate alarm that they see on social media, um, the COVID, the monkeypox now, all these messages creating a lot of anxiety in our youth. Are you able to separate that out from what you're studying that when we say it might be related to climate, is it related to really to what's happening factually in the climate? Or is it their fear of what they're seeing on social media and of speculation and not necessarily facts related to COVID or climate, whatever? How, how do we know the difference of what's causing? We, we can agree on this. Our youth are stressed out. Um, and, but my question is, is that stress coming from the climate or is the stress coming from a whole host of misinformation on the internet or on, on the, um, from social media? Well, kids are very well informed about climate science. They and I'm sorry, could you speak happened. up just a little bit? It's hard to hear up here in the north. And, if, and, uh, and sorry, sorry. Uh, and if Dr. Ossoff, you can introduce yourself for the record. Before speaking, uh, thank you. Again. Um, you know, kids are responding to climate science, you know, and climate science is predicting what's happening with remarkable accuracy. So I don't think they're responding to alarmism uh, in, in, the, in the media when they're worried about their climate future. Um, there's no evidence from any of the large studies that have been done in youth so far um, that, that, that the problem is the social media exposure. It's really their anxiety about what's happening to the planet, about which they have great concern and love. You know, they have great love for the natural resources that we all cherish as well. Um, so um, I, I don't think that that's a social alarmism is really the issue. Uh, and just one last follow-up, uh, Chair. Uh, go ahead. Um, but if I may, uh, I, I'll, I'll uh, gladly give you the follow-up. But one of the things I just wanted to uh, get some clarification on. So um, I, I, I haven't kept up with the uh, you know studies on impacts of social media, although I'm sure that there are um, I'm sure there are some some impacts on mental health from that. But I just wanted to also get clarification. So you both in your presentation, you both mentioned um, anxiety related to the state of the climate, but then you also, uh, in terms of, of Assemblywoman Hansen's question, also talked about research that shows specific links between um, some of the, the climate-related impacts, specifically heat and air pollution, on brain health and, and mental health. Is the, I just want to make sure that's correct. So there's kind of two, two separate things, both in anxiety and then the specific impacts from heat and pollution. Is that correct? That's correct. So it's sort of the biological impacts, it's psychological impacts. Um, and those are distinct things. Thank you for that. And go ahead, uh, Assemblywoman Hansen. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would just, um, you said that there's no necessarily um, correlation that youth are stressed by the social media and the climate um, messages. We do know that social media, there are studies, Mayo has one in 2014, uh, that especially with young women from the ages 14 and up, uh, that, that social media since about 2014 when the study was released, um, that they there is indeed an impact on anxiety, depression, um, in these age groups, and especially with females. So there, there, is, there are the studies out there, and, and I will follow up for the committee just because I know we're going long, and I will get those sent over to the committee and make sure that, um, um, that I CC you on it as well. Um, so I appreciate the, the extra indulgence, Chair. There's, there's Thank you no for that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Haas. Question that, that social media is very bad for the for the self esteem and well being of young people. That is not any in any way something that I was suggesting is not the case. I'm just saying that in the studies that have been done of young people about their attitudes towards climate change, there's no evidence in those studies that that is social media posts that is causing that anxiety. That that's where their exposure is coming from. So that that was all I was trying to. 
Thank you for that clarification. And uh, thank you, Assemblywoman. Please do send around those resources. And I, I think um, the, at least um, the, the case that's being made by our presenter, again, is that uh, addition of percents. Uh, so, you know, there are many different factors, um, but there are some that are particularly related to, uh, you know, increased exposure to heat or air pollution. Um, that are contributing to, again, what you've noted that we all agree on that we're seeing, which is, um, you know, some worsening um, mental health uh, impacts uh, in our youth and in our community. Uh, open it up to other questions from committee. Oh, sorry, Senator Hansen, you're next. Go ahead. Trying to dodge me there. I, I would catch up with you, Chair. Thank you. Actually, a follow-up on Alexis's question. Um, having studied this extensively for years and having been, like, like our daughter is actually a psychologist, and you know she mentioned all that. But having done my own homework on it, one thing that's been very, very consistent in all this is what I would call apocalyptic predictions that in the next 10 years, uh, if you heard, uh, what's her name, Greta Thunberg or whatever from Sweden, her predictions for all the young people are in 10 years, the whole world's collapsing, we don't do something now. I can trace that exact theory back to at least Paul Ehrlich and his predictions of the hundreds of millions of people starving to death in the 70s. An Inconvenient Truth, which I've read extensively in his other works as well. Same thing, where whole world's collapsing. Um, there's even a book out by a very liberal guy running for governor of California, Apocalypse Never. Uh, and he points out that all these predictions that we've been telling all the young people are in fact nonsense and that while there are problems, they're manageable and the world is not coming to an end. Yet the majority of the kids have heard nothing. Like the young lady that testified here this morning. What was she, nine or 10? 12, 12 years old, she's worried that the world basically is going to come to an end unless the Nevada legislature deals with climate change. And that's the kind of message we're sending to kids. You're going you're gonna to sit here and tell us that the mental health messages, excuse me, the mental health attitudes of our young people are not being impacted by these kinds of constant messages that they're guilty of using carbon-based uh, fuels and that they're guilty of using air conditioning and driving automobiles, and that's ruining the planet, and ultimately within 10 years, everything's going to die from polar bears on down. That has no a a impact on mental health of young people? Dr. Haas, do you want to respond to that? Um, you know, I don't know that I really can, uh, but um, because there isn't, uh, I, I'm not sure that I can. But that's fine. That's, that's okay. I just wanted to extend the opportunity. Senator Hansen, I, I appreciate uh, what you're bringing up. I, I do think that uh, uh, the what was brought up in public comment was uh, spurred particularly by the fact that uh, that uh, uh, students' school and home almost burned to the ground. Um, more than, uh, you know, some of those uh, uh, other issues that you brought up. But, um, well, Mr. Do, Chair, uh, I, I, would agree, I would agree with that particular case. But when you talk to young people, and even on the Senate floor, the youngest member there got up and said that the world's coming to an end, basically, even though we're living better than ever in the entire planet. But everybody, all the young people have been told for, you know, if we don't do something within 10 years, and like I said, you can go back for 40, 50 years with those kind of predictions, and they've all been apocalyptically based, and all have been wrong. Yet the kids who grew Again, up in that environment I heard that your, mentally. I, I appreciate your comments, Senator. And again, the focus of our meetings uh, and our presentations is actually um, pretty aligned with what you've said, is that, uh, you know, we continue to learn more uh, about some of the impacts uh, that we're having, and we have been successful at tackling many of them and so we're trying to to gather some information about um, kind of the, the the latest research on what certain impacts are and uh, and what we can do about them um, and, and getting away from uh, you know those doom and gloom scenarios towards uh, uh, you know meaningful and specific uh, actions that we can take uh, both uh, as the state government uh, as well as individuals and members of the community. So uh, again, appreciate it. Uh, Very good, thank you, Chair. from other members of the committee. All right, seeing none. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Haas. Uh, oh, actually, I, I do have one last question. Sorry, before I let you go. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, kind of the impact side, but 
One of the things that's been extremely interesting to me is um, both kind of the research and some of the emerging action uh, in using um, uh, outdoor recreation and exposure as a treatment um, for physical and for mental health. Um, you know, there's been a kind of growing conversation around uh, the idea of prescribing time in the outdoors as a way to um, uh, to help uh, address mental health issues. I know the state of New York has uh, recently passed legislation kind of asking different agencies to come together and, and look at ways that they could improve um, that public health infrastructure, particularly for veterans, so that uh, when they uh, get into the healthcare system and are having mental health issues, um, that we could actually um, find some way to cover through our public health infrastructure, uh, getting them transportation, uh, park passes, other things to actually help them get out and spend time in the outdoors as a way to help um, treat mental health. So I was just wondering if you could speak um, at all to, to that concept and if you have any thoughts to share on how we can use um, our, our natural resources as a way to help um, uh, combat some of the negative mental health impacts that we've generally seen across the state. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's abundant evidence of the therapeutic role that nature can play in, in blood pressure and depression and anxiety. And so the more you can connect people to those natural environments, the better what you're talking about is called social prescribing, where you have often a peer or a, a social worker or a lesser uh, level of training required person that is connecting the person up to their community and, and up to group involvement and other things that are good for mental health, nature being one of those things. And the, the, the advantages of getting people out into nature go well beyond the mind. They also go to getting people in better physical shape um, and, and other physical benefits. And they also uh, tie into the general trend that we're trying to, uh, to support in mental health, which is getting people out of the individual office and connected to their communities and to their supports in that way and using peers and, and other kinds of mental health workers uh, to give them non-medication solutions to uh, their problems. Um, and so very much in support of maximal access for all people to outdoor space of all kinds. Um, and to animals as well. I have multiple patients that used to be on benzodiazepines, medications like Xanax, who are now on therapy dogs. That's their medication. And uh, they're very much more happy to have their dog get them through their anxiety than their pill. Thank you very much for that. And, you know, um, kind of related is we've seen an increasing shift in public health to uh, using public health resources to support uh, housing um, and because uh, having shelter is linked to so many other health outcomes. And so I think it's it's also interesting to think about access to uh, nature, outdoors, uh, support animals, um, you know, specifically as um, a health measure and how we can, um, again, bridge the divide when, uh, when we think about some of the programs and resources there. So uh, thank you for that. All right. Um, with that, thank you again, Dr. Haas, for taking the time to present to us today. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll now move on to the last item on our agenda, item number 11, which uh, we have two remaining presenters. And uh, I believe first up, we're going to hear from uh, a representative at the Department of Health and Human Services. I believe we have uh, Ms. McDade Williams uh, joining us. So uh, welcome. Uh, please come on up and uh, whenever you are ready, you may introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, um, members of the committee. For the record, Marla McDade Williams, uh, Deputy Director with the Department of Health and Human Services. So I'm, okay, just trying to get coordinated here. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I was asked to address public health climate change um, and the role of DA the Department of Health and Human Services with Nevada tribes. 
um, you can see there are kind of some of the topics that I'll be talking about. But you know, on a, on a um, and I've you guys have heard a lot today, so I just put in a quote here of, um, as the climate continues to warm, the risk to human health will grow, exacerbating existing health threats and creating new public health challenges. And, um, you know, when speaking about Nevada tribes, you have to understand that Nevada reservations are risk-prone areas. Um, they're isolated. They are the first ones subject to drought. Um, many of them are in deserts. Um, and, you know, communities have grown into them, right? The reservations were set aside to move people away from the general population. And as communities have grown, they've grown into the communities or into the reservations. Um, but not a lot of the relationships have changed. They are still food insecure on the reservations. Um, they depend a lot on farming and ranching um, and hunting and fishing. And all of those things are affected by... Um, what goes on out in the larger culture. I mean, there's a lot of talk earlier about silos. We in the Department of Health and Human Services don't do anything with farming and ranching or hunting and fishing. Um, but some of those things are um, definitely related to security um, and you know social, ter social determinants of health in um, these res tribal communities. So I don't want to go into a lot of um, background about really the specifics of, of um, the issues on the reservations. I did link to, in this next item, um, climate changes, tribal and indigenous health uh, from the Public Health Newswire. It highlights some of the key issues that are concerns for tribal communities, climate and health, food sovereignty and access, infrastructure and systems development, resource extraction, clean air, and clean water. If you look at this, um, presentation or this documentation from the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians called Tribal Priorities for Solving the Climate Crisis. Again, there are five bullet points there that um, I think represent the majority of tribes throughout the West. Expand resources specifically for mental and behavioral health. Increase telemedicine options and address broad brand infrastructure need. Ensure that tribal governments have access to and control over data related to public health. Specify outreach with youth and elders in climate health programs and recognize racism as a public health crisis. So within the Department of Health and Human Services, there's a recognition that there are challenges in tribal communities. And as you all know, um, through funding opportunities in the last couple of years, there's been widespread support for broadband, um, getting broadband into um, tribal communities, which are in rural areas, which, you know, benefit, again, all the rural areas, which also have the same access um, issues related to um, physicians and specialist providers and all of those other things. So, you know, these efforts benefit everybody um, if we can have better telemedicine capacity out in these communities. Um, you know, there are opportunities to help with food security on a population basis. I've linked to this article, Nevada Tribes Receive Funding for Nutrition Center in Latest Round of HUD Grants. Um, I believe this is in Walker River, where they're looking at seed-to-table um, opportunities that they have in that community out in Shures. And if you've been to Shures, you know that there's a river that goes, well, there's a, a river that trickles through, and there's not a lot of water there. So you know, how they are able, uh, you know, and again, and it's affected their farming um, as well. They don't have access to the same amount of water, right? So how do you, um, how do you sustain your, your cattle and your horses and your livestock when you don't have the ability to irrigate and, you know, farm and, and all of those things? So um, this is an effort that will help, um, they believe, help that community um, continue to have food security. There's no grocery store there. There used to be, you know, there's a, there's a, um, convenience store. It's basically a gas station. Uh, they used to have a grocery store, um, you know, somebody who it was his line of business. And then when he left, there was nobody else to pick that up. And so, um, you know, and they have to travel whatever it is, 30 miles, you know, to Yarrington or 40 miles to Hawthorne or 45 miles to Fallon, whatever it is, it's just not really convenient. Um, and anyway, so um, we also have funding for mental and behavioral health. We have chronic disease prevention programs, um, and we have the Office of Minority Health and Equity, who you will hear from next. We also have an extensive tribal liaison network. Um, we have them in each division. Um, they do, we do hold regular meetings with tribal representatives, and this was actually passed before the law was enacted 
um, relating to tribal consultation and having tribal liaisons. I do want to say, though, and I t briefly touched on this um, out into my presentation, but um, there is no job classification for tribal liaisons in state government. There's job classifications for a health program specialist or a management analyst. So we end up plugging people in to these roles, and um, I think it comes at the expense of uh, really truly understanding some of our tribal communities because people who could fill these roles from tribal communities can't get the positions because they don't meet the qualifications of a health program specialist or um, whatever those things are. Moving on, so challenges for tribes. Um, tribes have historically worked through the federal government, right? They don't have a lot of experience working with state government. So again, um, I've linked to an article um, titled Pandemic Illuminates Longstanding Gaps in Relations with Nevada Tribes and Opportunity for Closer Ties. And this actually relates to efforts um, undertaken during the pandemic to and work with tribes to get food to them. But I, I did want to mention that they're in, if you do have a chance to link to that article, the opening picture is, is of duck water. And again, you can see the remoteness of, of that area. Um, if you've ever traveled there, you know that it's a dirt road to get there, um, you know, depending on which way you go in. So, you know, very isolated communities. So that leads to the next point, that the remoteness means that the professional staff aren't always available. So whether it's professional staff working for the tribes or whether or not it's um, professional staff that can go into the tribes, they're just, they're just not there. And so, um, you know, when we talk about cultural competence is, is still needed, if you don't have people from those communities, it's going to be very difficult to try to break through and um, figure out how we can work together to make things happen to benefit everybody. Um, there's an extensive need for guidance on statutory and regulatory opportunities that come forward just in our agency, not to mention all of the other um, agencies in government. And then I think we in government have an expectation that tribes have resources they don't have, right? If I call you to a meeting, you know, you should be able to come to a meeting. And, um, you know, when you've got a tribal chairman who is doing five jobs, when you have an expectation that um, a tribal chairman is there to manage the day-to-day -day business of the tribe, they can't be running off to all of these different meetings to, um, to try to carry their issues forward. So you know, that goes to the next point there. Um, it's disruptive and it's expensive, um, and it's even more expensive you know, today. Um, this picture is one that I took on my way out to um, go shoot. So anybody who's had the opportunity to go out to go shoot, um, I think it's a it's an oasis out there in the middle of nowhere, you know, when you get there, but it is quite a trek, and um, and we expect that go shoot chairman to 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 come to every meeting, you know, to talk about their issues and um, just you know I think our lenses um, have to recognize that there are challenges that we just don't deal with here in Carson City, um, and even you know traveling to the reservations that's what I did on this trip but it wasn't for the state it was um, in a previous role but you know it's it's just not sustainable for state government you know to consistently go out and so we have to have um, different ways of doing business so <clears throat> so as it relates to opportunities related to climate change and public health Nevada has increasingly supported tribes, and it has resulted in numerous state laws that have benefited tribes and tribal people. And I think this has been an effort probably gained strength in the last four to six legislative sessions. And um, I think tribes are better understanding that you know state government can really be an access point for them, and it can really be beneficial for them. But again, it's, it's, um, it's a change. And so one of the ways that we can really help facilitate uh, communication and access to programs is embedding staff within tribes or within the Nevada Indian Commission or the Intertribal Council of Nevada. And that might help gel connections. And the Nevada Indian Commission, um, Director Montooth, she just works her tail off to, to try to do everything she can, but she's a one-person show. Or, you know, she has two other staff, but you know, in terms of the, the policy work, but, you know, she, she doesn't have 
the high level professional staff either. And again, she's, you know, that agency is a state agency subject to the same hiring controls that everybody else has. So if she has someone who would be good, um, if they don't meet the qualifications for her program officer position or whatever it is, she can't hire them. So those are real challenges um, just for her. Um, but again, I think, you know, really looking at ways to, to get staff into these communities could be helpful. Um, offering opportunities and areas to build professional capacity for Nevada Native students and help them understand future needs. Um, in the last legislative session, um, there were a lot of committees that tribes um, got placed on to be members of. And for one, it's been difficult to find people to fill those positions. Um, you know, because we always want to look to the, the tribal council and the tribes themselves, and again, they're, they're resource thin. So, but there also are, you know, if there are people out there, we don't know where, where they are. We don't know where to find them, um, you know, who could really participate and understand. I actually am appointed to the State Land Use Planning Advisory Committee as a member appointed by the Nevada Indian Commission, um, you know, just because I understand state systems, right, and I can help communicate back and forth between them. But there's just a dearth of, of Native people um, in, in throughout state government in professional positions that can help do some of this work. And um, so that's my appeal to, you know, help us figure out a way to, to really help people understand what the opportunities are within state government. Again, and recognizing the remoteness and figuring out ways to hire state staff, get applicants qualified based on other experience while allowing them to work at their home locations could help us bridge some of these gaps. I did want to highlight a success um, within the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, this happened quite a few years ago where um, through the Public Health Preparedness Program, we were able to hire a tribal liaison and that position, I believe, worked in the director's office. But it's grown and extended out to the Division of Emergency Management. And through COVID-19, um, the Division of Emergency Management team worked with tribes. And they were really the go-to agency for tribes. If they had a question, they're like, they're calling their emergency manager. And DEM is working with all of the other agencies to, to try to help meet needs in these um, communities. And... Um, Here's just a quote from um, John Bachtel, the Deputy Administrator at the Division of Emergency Management. The participation and direct feedback from the members is key to giving DEM and PHP advice and guidance. And I can attest to how that works, right? I've been through legislative sessions where a bill would come up on emergency management, and I would, um, I would go to the tribes, and I would say, do you guys know anything about this? And they'd say, yeah, they already told us about this, and, you know, and we're good with it. And... Um, I tell you, it was, it was really heartwarming to see that level of communication with that agency and tribal communities, because it does not happen. Um, you know, we do our best, but I can tell you, um, we, we struggle having that same type of partnership. And I think it's because they have, have just, um, they have a d devoted resource to do it, and, um, and they're committed to it. So um, just in wrapping this up, uh, I've often heard that we need to meet people where they are, and I think that's what we need to do with tribal communities. Um, we keep wanting to put a you know square hole into no a round hole <laughs> into a square box or whatever that is, and um, it, you know it's just not going to work right now. I, you know tribes are just they are working as hard as they can with the resources they have, but they don't have any resources. <laughs> um, so there are many communities in Nevada where we need to apply this practice and remove our lens of expectations that everyone does things like we do in state government. Um, so we need to analyze opportunities to extend direct funding and staffing into communities, build their capacity, and forego, forego some of the expectations for managing funding. And I'm not saying that they get to spend it on whatever they want, but you know, bureaucratically speaking, the, um, we can put up a lot of barriers when we are trying to issue funding to people. and. Um, you know, and I, it's as much our problem as it is the legislature's problem, right, when there, there are all these rules that everybody has to follow. Um, so, you know, just throwing that out there. Um, and I just finally say that we won't make progress by sitting back and continuing to complain, complain that the tribal communities aren't meeting our needs. Um, we have to do as much to help meet theirs. And I think, at, you know, at, and again, at the Department of Health and Human Services, we are um, committed to, to doing that. Um, and we are trying to work through all the other challenges that are put in front of us as well. 
um, and you know, and the legislature has always been supportive. So, so I do very much appreciate that, um, and I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, Deputy Director. We appreciate um, that the presentation and the perspective that you provided. Um, I know I, for one, am, am interested in in following up to see um, what are some options that we have to uh, improve some of those pathways and pipelines into uh, into public service um, and and uh, you know conducting some of the professional development that you talked about and. Uh, I'd hope that I'd find some support for figuring out areas where there's some barriers or red tape that we could cut um, in that. So uh, we'll open it up to members for questions. We'll start with Assemblywoman Titus, then we'll go to Assemblywoman Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, for the questions. And Deputy Director uh, Williams, you are, have been a steadfast advocate for folks in the rurals and the tribes, and thank you for staying with that, and I always appreciate your presentations, and thank you. A um, couple observations I have and then some questions. First, um, I agree with you. I think that broadband has to get out to the tribes, uh, not just for telemedicine, but perhaps some of this education and being able to communicate um, with tribal members better. It's tough. I mean, you're, you did a you, you stated that traveling um, to the reservation and for them to travel here, it's difficult. You're speaking to the four legislators who travel the most in the state. So um, to say that traveling is an issue, I, I will tell you that all four of us and the only other person that's not sitting here that could be is Senator Gokachia. We put thousands of miles thousands of miles on our vehicles all the time going to meetings like this or going out to our constituents. I alone now, you know, if it falls, if it comes to fruition, I will represent from Douglas County, Lake Tahoe, all the way down to Dyer, Fish Lake Valley, which I've been traveling the last couple of months. So the distance is not unique to Nevadans and trying to get here and make that an effort. It's a conscious effort that we do that. So I understand the traveling difficulties because we, the four of us, live that difficulties. Um, so I understand that. So getting broadband there, I certainly support that. I certainly believe in telemedicine and being able to educate and, but, and in, important to engage the youth early to get them willing to, and know the options that there are to being, um, to being an advocate. I mean, I believe in advocates for health care. I believe in advocate for the seniors. I believe in advocates for who you represent and believe in. So certainly support that. My question is, during the last legislative session, maybe the one before, we passed a law allowing marijuana dispensaries on tribal land. You mentioned that their only income that the tribes have or sources is um, agriculture. Food, that, that the, they have the problem with food security because it's farming and ranching and hunting and fishing. And certainly the, the tribes that I know and I drive out to and know very well is the, the Walker River tribe and the, the Shures. Uh, going out to Shures and know that they the water sits there in Weber Reservoir um, above Shures, and I know that they still irrigate with this, and I know that the the Walker River is chock a buck full of willows, so it doesn't really get to the to Walker Lake because it's stuck right there. So there are many issues there. But where's the money coming from Indian gaming? Where is it going to Indian gaming and the marijuana dispensaries? What are their tribes doing? with that source of income. I know they've gotten a lot of outside money for broadband and other things, but we're, what benefit has it been to the tribes for those two sources of incomes, gaming and the marijuana dispensaries? Thank you. For the record, Marla McDade-Williams, Deputy Director, Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, I'm really not qualified to, to answer that. I mean, you could bring in any, any particular chairman, but um, I think you have to recognize that those economic development opportunities um, aren't going to generate revenue like they are in the you know, larger metropolitan areas. They're going to generate some local revenue for sure. And some tribes have used some of that money to, you know, I think somebody bought a a new fire truck or, uh, you know, I, so they're, they're using it as they can to, to build capacity. And it's also providing some local employment, but I think the scale of it just isn't right. It's, it's way different. Um, it's way different than many of the larger operations. Um, you know, gaming, again, I, you know, I believe the Washoe tribe has, um, a gaming establishment in, um, Gardnerville, you know, it competes with all of the other gaming establishments in downtown Gardnerville. So, 
you know, it the the revenue streams there are just they're they're way different um, than when you're in a metropolitan area and you have access to a larger population um, to 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 buy those things. So there are some opportunities, but they're small. And and Paul, that if I might. Uh, Mr. Chair, just is there any Go ahead. we in here? We're you know the transparency, government account, transparency. We have to account for from our uh, city the budgets to county budgets to the state budgets. The transparency has to be there on where that money goes and how it is being spent and on the marijuana funds. Is there any any transparency oversight or anybody that where we can see where that money is being spent and and how? the different tribes, because they're all independent nations and where they're spending that money on, so we know or, or have information, or do we, that's not available to anybody. The tribes are just their own nations, and nobody gets to over... I'm not saying control it. I'm just saying knowledge of where it's being spent. For the record, Marla McDade-Williams. Again, uh, not representing any specific tribe, but they 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 do know where they're spending it. Um, whether or not they want to give that out to someone else, I think, is a question for each of those tribes. The, the system is set up, you know, they have to have a regulatory body, particularly for their cannabis operations. They have to have a regulatory body over that. Um, I, you know, I do know that um, tribes don't have to, um, you know, the state is not going to come in and um, in, in, audit their records, right? The state has to ask permission if they wanted to have access to the records in terms of like the regulatory bodies. So, but from a policy perspective, again, I, you know, it's possible that every tribe that, that tribe that does have them, if you ask the question that they'd be willing to share that, but um, there's no requirement that, as you said, that they have to share it. All right, thank you. Um, we'll move on to Assemblywoman Hansen and then Senator Hansen. Thank you, Chair. And it's so good to see you, uh, Ms. Mc, uh, Ms. Le, Mc, I know your name. I was going to say Marla, but Ms. Williams. Um, and in your new position, um, I think we're asking you questions that might have applied to your, your old position, but uh, you've been a lifeline. Uh, just a quick little shout out to you. I appreciate I have a lot of tribes in my district. Uh, they're near and dear to my heart and, and uh, feel for you in some of the water woes. And uh, when I've had concerns or questions, you've always been really good about making sure uh, we as legislators are up to speed and that there's a voice uh, for those tribes. And I've appreciated that. Um, when we talk about broadband, uh, ha have we visited the idea um, of Starlink um, and just bypass broadband altogether? Um, are you familiar with Starlink, the, uh, Elon Musk's technology that's satellite-driven? Um, I had great success with some constituents in Battle Mountain um, and, and others that I'm getting. We're, it's, it's really starting to spread, and I wonder if that's something that we could look into. Um, and, and I've heard it's wonderful, uh, it's fast, reliable, and that might solve some of those issues for Zoom. Uh, so that they don't, you know, members don't have to travel in. I also love your suggestion that, you know, we come there. You know, I, I know when I have come to um, those areas, I appreciate it, and I think it's important for us to get out there. I'm, we're going there for public lands out to Pyramid Lake, um, and so I think for all of us, we need to make more of an effort as well and let us spend $6 a gallon <laughs> going out uh, to visit some of our, our uh, uh, tribal lands here in, in the state of Nevada and get, get that input directly and, and take that message to them. Um, I had another question, but it seems to have slipped my mind. Um, well, I'll come back. The chair's been very uh, gracious, so if it comes back to my memory, I'll, I'll ask for another, uh, another question. Thank you. Did you have a chance to answer about Starlink? For the record, Marla McDade Williams. So I, I think as a, you know, I don't know anything about Starlink personally. I do know that there was a lot of, and I don't know what the limitations are on the on the federal funding um, that moved through. I know that there was a lot of effort to try and um, get some system that would be beneficial for them. And um, the Intertribal Council of Nevada actually worked 
pretty closely on all of that. I'm, I'm happy to follow up with a question to her to see if that was posed as an option. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of issues at play on the reservations, right? There's developing just the infrastructure on the reservation, and then there's um, people being able to afford to pay for the infrastructure when once it gets there. So I don't know exactly where those things are at, um, but I'm happy to pose the question. And I'll, uh, Chair, I'm Thank sorry. Thank you. Uh, uh, and I'll do some follow up uh, myself. I'm sorry, Chair. I'll, I'll do some follow up as no well problem. and share just... share the information. It, it involves a dish. It, it, the infrastructure is not huge. And and I was just going to say that um, you know there's been a lot of conversations, uh, in, you know, in in other committees and um, in the state about broadband expansion um, and some of those initiatives, and so. Um, we can have our staff connect with uh, um, the Office of Science, Innovation, and Technology, who's been working a lot on uh, expanding uh, high-speed internet access and uh, uh, you know, pose those questions and, and uh, get some information back to the committee. All right. Uh, let's see. I think uh, next we have Senator Hansen, then Assemblyman Ellison. Thanks, Chair. Marla, don't feel bad. I don't know anything about Starlink either. <laughs> and my wife's one pushing it all the time. <laughs> so a uh, couple questions. You mentioned you, uh, you need additional staff funding, but then you also mentioned you have a dearth of professionals. Are you suggesting that we kind of like change the standards for staffing so that you have more people that are available since you have a shortage of, I guess, officially, you know, trained professionals with college degrees or whatever is required? For the record, Marla McDade-Williams, I think what I'm suggesting is recognition that people have different levels of experience. And if you have a system that expects one level of experience and discounts this other level of experience so that you can't gain access through this door, that that's what we look at. Okay, well, I'm just wondering how, you know, what I want to do is obviously you need to get the staffing, but you've had some issues of being able to get people that either feel qualified or meet state standards. That was what I, uh, the impression I got. So anyway, I, we want to make sure that they, that you have the resources and the requirements to fit the needs of, of the tribes. Um, question on uh, travel distances. I assume tribes are definitely would qualify as underserved communities. The cost of fuel has got to be killing them. Um, what's the impact been for, for the tribes for like, you know, when gas hits six bucks a gallon? For the record, Marla McDade-Williams, I mean, it's the same as it is for everybody else, right? I mean, you, um, you have to start planning what you're going to town for. You don't, you're not going to go to town for an ice cream cone tonight. You're, you know, you're going to go to town when you can plan it and you're going to get all of your groceries. And are you going to go into Fallon and consider the prices in Fallon or are you going to go all the way into Reno um, because, you know, maybe you'll, it'll be a little bit cheaper there. I mean, it's like everybody else, right? You have to make decisions on what's the most cost effective for you and your family. Um, well, it's kind of like everybody else. I don't have to drive 50 miles to get to the grocery store. So it's a little, you know, it's a lot more of an issue for you on, on a remote re a reservation, you know. You drive from McDermott to Winnemucca is, what, 90 miles? So that's the closest grocery store, unless you want to hit the convenience store in Nevada. Um, we'd like to get a comment back to the Pyramid Lake tribe. You know, and this is one, Mr. Chair, for the public lands people and the natural resources folks. The, the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe had a problem with the, their feral horse population. They had over 500 of them on the reservation, absolutely tearing up the entire the reservation. The Indians went and rounded all those horses up, put them on trucks, shipped them to, I believe, Mexico within two days, problem solved. And believe me, in the state of Nevada, we've talked about this issue. If we really want to follow the lead of the indigenous peoples and how you take care of problems of feral populations of, of animals, the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe set a gold standard that the state of Nevada and the Bureau of Land Management should, uh, should follow. So please let them know that there's one uh, assemblyman that thinks they really did a first-class job of just, you know, Ball was in their court, they had a problem, they handled it professionally, properly, and now the reservation, the, the, uh, the entire environment of the reservation is, is going to be dramatically improved. So please get that back to the, to the uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute uh, tribe for me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hansen. We'll go on to Assemblyman Ellison. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Marla, I, I like calling them McDade and Williams because I know a whole bunch of them names. Uh, you know, I, I've cowboyed with most of these guys, you know, my age and younger through the years and, and uh, the greatest people in the world, the best cowboys in the world. But uh, some of the problems I see right now is the dispensary and some of the young people out there in Elko. It's, you can see the crime going up and, and the problems they're having. And these young kids are really getting in trouble. And I don't know what to do. The police don't know what to do. The tribal police don't do anything. And then the, the people that we know up at the reservation, they keep calling and asking for help. Well, it's a sovereign nation. There's nothing I can do. So we, we need to get help to them guys up there. And, and it, it's got out of the hand where some of them are uh, probably going to end up in a lot of problem eventually. But they're good people at this getting led the wrong way. And I don't know why, and it's not the marijuana. It's I don't know if that was the gateway, but they're on some pretty heavy, heavy, heavy drugs. And you know, I hope and maybe you can help do something. I don't know what, but uh, anything we can do to help, I'm more than happy to. But they're good kids. We just got to get them away from it. And the stores, I think there's got to be some kind of funding to get some of these stores. I mean, all the people up in Mountain City, look what they went through for years. And and trying to get through there, and they'd have to drive from McDerm or from uh, way all the way down to Mountain City, and then they got the store back up there, and uh, and they worked really good. So there's got to be some kind of funding to help get some of these stores. And I know up in McDermott, uh, you know, look how far they got to go. So whatever we can do to help, I I I'd do anything to help you guys. But we really got to help them kids before they get in worse problems. Thank you, uh, Assemblyman Ellis. And I, for the record, Marla McDade Williams, through the Fund for Resilient Nevada, the settlement dollars for opioid funding, we do anticipate um, needing to be able to direct funding opportunities to tribal nations to help deal with those issues. Um, I'm not a mental health professional, um, but I think I've seen it my whole life. You know, if there's no sense of belonging and there's no sense of what's my future, um, you're you're gonna waste your life away because you, you don't feel belong belonging in that community. Um, so you know there are a lot of issues tied up in it, and one of those is um, you know letting people feel proud of who they are. Um, I share way too much personal stuff lately when I'm um, testifying. I shouldn't be given a microphone anymore. Um, but you know recently in I testified to the Legislative Committee on Education on a personal level. The, um, there was a decision made that you couldn't wear any of your tribal um, re regalia while, while you were going through graduation. Um, that doesn't go very far to make you feel like you're a welcome part of your community when there's no cultural recognition. And I think that's what I'm trying to say in this presentation is that, you know, we, we throw around the term cultural, um, I can't even remember what it is now, um, cultural competence. Um, it's not, you know, training people who didn't grow up in those communities to really understand that community. Sometimes it's helping those people in those communities recognize how they can fit into these systems so that then they can transfer those skill sets into helping people in those communities that they come from. A follow up, Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much. Uh, Go I, ahead, Assemblyman. I, I do have an idea, and I don't know if it has ever worked. But uh, the money, you know, the tribes are really fighting with the dispensary. And what they need to do is, is I think every tribe that's got a dispensary should have to be forced to put X amount of money either into education or youth programs out of them dispensaries because they're making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. You should see the cars that go up there. The one in Jackpot is massive. But... Uh, um, I think if they could say, okay, you guys are going to do this, you're going to make this kind of money, X amount of money has got to go into the youth program or something. And that way you can control it and help them kids. Right now, uh, they're all arguing who, where it's going and how it's getting there. But I, I, I think if they could do that, uh, you know, to the nation, then maybe they could help these guys. And that's what I'd propose, if you could maybe put that out there and that uh, X amount of money, it'd go to it, a percentage. That's just a thought. 
Thank you, Assemblyman. I think we'll, we'll treat that as a comment uh, to keep things moving along, but appreciate it. Uh, members, any other questions? All right. Seeing no, no other questions, thank you again, Deputy Director McDade-Williams, for, for uh, taking the time to come and speak with us today. With that, we'll move on to the last uh, presenter that we have on our agenda today. Uh, we have a, a representative from the Office of Minority Health and Equity uh, to uh, present to us. Hello, uh, uh, Ms. Dorch. Um, you can uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed whenever you are ready. Hello, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can, and we can see your slides. Very good, very good. Thank you, and, and good afternoon to you, Mr. Chair, and to the other members of the Joint Committee. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Tina Dorch, and since 2018, I've had the distinct privilege of serving as a program manager for the Nevada Office of Minority Health and Equity. Um, it's a program that is also within the director's office uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services. So I thank you again for this time. And I've been asked to speak on the subject matter of uh, an overview for climate change issues related to environmental justice and health disparities. And I just have a four point agenda, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'm gonna begin by setting the stage um, by describing trends that we witness. These trends are usually categorized as disproportionate impacts. Um, second, I'm going to then speak to the state's plan to address uh, what we recognize as a social justice issue, um, specifically environmental disparities, um, through the action of Governor Sisolak um, to create a new equity-focused team. Um, and then third, I'm going to explain the role of this new team. And then lastly, I'm going to present uh, the approach that this new team is going to follow um, as it governs our, that governs our efforts to address these environmental uh, disparities. Uh, environmental factors, when coupled with social inequities, well, this can result in health disparities. And you've heard this conversation, you've heard this said many times before today. Um, these disparities are disproportionately experienced by underserved or marginalized communities. And these communities are often populated by persons who identify as Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, when observed, um, um, more thoughtfully, uh, these trends begin to emerge. And when we see these trends, we start seeing them along certain lines, um, things like environmental factors and how they can lead to disease and health disparities when places where BIPOC persons either live or they work or they play, um, these are things that we refer to as social determinants of health. Well, these are also burdened by social inequities. And without careful attention to issues of race and class, climate change, uh, adaptation measures, they run the risk of uh, perpetuating or worsening these social inequities. Another trend that we take note of is that climate change tends to have the worst effect on people who have the lowest health equity or those who do not have adequate opportunities to be healthier. And that climate change is often an underreported contributor to deaths. As witnessed in Las Vegas, where heat-related mortality has increased over the last 10 years. Um, and the source for this data has been uh, provided by the National Weather Service. Also another trend is that climate change in Nevada can produce health threats related to extreme heat, to air pollution, to drought, to noxious air uh, and land use issues, and even wildfires that you've heard about also this, uh, during this, today's hearing. When specifically considering the example of extreme heat, this phenomenon disproportionately impacts vulnerable communities. And, and just state it plainly, communities that are the least able to cope with this condition are most likely to experience it without resources to aid them. An analysis of over 80 urban areas done by the National Public Radio um, in, in conjunction with uh, other academia, it shows that nine US cities throughout these particular cities, there's a strong correlation between where the poorest people live and the hottest parts of town are noted. And then when we think about um, this particular phenomenon, that even when it's non-lethal, it exacerbates many chronic diseases. Now, this is a category that in and of itself is disproportionately experienced by marginalized communities. 
For example, when tailpipe emissions combined with sunlight and extreme heat conditions um, come together, this type of exposure can impact heart and lung functionality. And these two organs are susceptible to chronic disease. Extreme heat can also cause disruption across social and economic conditions, uh, which are experienced much more severely by these disenfranchised communities. And so in order to act on these trends, what we believe is that there needs to be validation through data. Um, again, the case is to be made that supports the need for increased development of Nevada specific demographically stratified data. Um, at this time, there have been localized climate impact studies in fact, you heard from one, I think it was our first presentation that was from the Gwen Center. And their report was entitled Strengthening Heat Resiliency in Communities of Color in Southern Nevada. Uh, that report I think was completed uh, in 2021. So it's pretty relevant and, re and, and timely. It defined extreme heat as a natural disaster and provides stratified results to, through its community needs assessment and also a gap analysis. And therefore the resulting policy recommendations they were formed based on diverse input. Throughout the report, COVID-19 impacts were also contrasted with the combination of marginalized demographics and COVID effectively demonstrating which subpopulations are disproportionately burdened. Reports and policy recommendations being predicated on stratified data is therefore important. It's in, in order to reinforce connections between climate change and health disparities experienced by these overburdened communities. And the more stratified or granular these indicators, the more effectively we can translate the resulting data into knowledge and then that knowledge into action. So during the 2022 State of the State Address, uh, Governor Sisolak acknowledged that historically marginalized communities are bearing the brunt of the impacts of climate change particularly when it comes to extreme heat. He then went on to announce that he would create a new equity focused team, a team that's known as the environmental justice team in order to address the disproportionate nature of environmental disparities. Members of the interagency environmental justice team include Sharina Diasis. She is the director of the governor's office for new Americans, Stacy Montu who was the executive director for the Nevada Indian Commission, and then myself. Uh, as of March of this year, we began meeting with support from the governor's office policy analyst, Jordan Hosmer Henner, to ensure that equity and justice are central to climate planning for the state. And at this stage in its development, the environmental justice team is tasked with three objectives. The first being that working with the state extreme heat planning team on the development of an extreme heat plan. This team was simultaneously formed by the governor and it includes Dr. Azam, who is the chief medical officer for the Nevada Department of Health and Human Services and Chief David Ferguson from the Nevada Division of Emergency Management and Office of Homeland Security. And they too are supported from, by the governor's office through uh, senior climate advisor, Kristen Averett. For our part, the environmental justice team will stress test the extreme heat plan from an equity perspective, which includes identifying potential threats and potential solutions. Um, we will aid policymakers in reaching an unbiased decision. Under the second objective, the environmental justice team will introduce, we will promote and will ensure that equitable state level actioning and the implementation of a federal initiative uh, known as Justice 40 Initiative. And you've heard that mentioned once before today as well. But this initiative is a Biden administration initiative that combines both environmental justice and economic development for the application across disadvantaged communities. It provisions that at least 40% of the overall benefits of federal investments in key programs related to climate, clean energy, transit, housing, workforce development, pollution remediation, and clean water infrastructure reach those marginalized and underserved communities overburdened by these environmental disparities. And Justice 40 is creating an infrastructure to help get these resources to those communities. 
Um, to that end, the White House Council on Environmental Quality released a preliminary climate and environment, the climate and economic justice screening tool um, that was released in February. Um, you've heard that mentioned as well. And the purpose of this tool is to help federal agencies identify those disadvantaged communities that are marginalized and are underserved. By doing that, uh, this tool will help make those decisions equitably and to ensure that that 40% resource is directed towards them and that applications that identify those communities are receiving those dollars. As for the third objective uh, per the governor, going forward, the environmental justice team will be involved in engaging on notable future actions that are intended to address climate change and will be serving as a point of contact that provides an equity perspective. Currently, the environmental justice team is refining an approach that will govern our efforts to address environmental disparities. Uh, the team is committed to build a resilient and robust environmental justice infrastructure, an infrastructure that educates the most marginalized members of our state so that they're prepared to identify environmental injustice and to also know where to locate access tools that serve to remediate those impacts. And the team is committed to building an infrastructure using equity focused principles, principles such as choice point decision making. Uh, this is a strategy that allows leaders to avoid reaching status quo or biased decisions. Another um, principle is community based participatory research, which has the ability to subvert power imbalances by giving voice to members of the most impacted communities and also health and all policy methodology, which cuts across seemingly unrelated sectors to reach a comprehensive, I'm sorry, to reach a comprehensive outcome that benefits, that benefits a community and all communities that are overly burdened by this particular initiative. So by employing such principles, the environmental justice team will foster inclusive and collaborative engagement. And the three visible steps that the environmental justice team is following as it builds this environmental justice infrastructure are, we're gonna be identifying and enhancing and activating a robust stakeholder network. We'll be connecting organizations on this topic and we will approach this as a coordinated equity focused intersectoral undertaking, identifying organizations again across all of those determinants of health. And we'll be defining champions from within each of those sectors to be sure that we garner buy-in and a sustainable support system and engagement. The second step will be to highlight, to amplify our federal, our state and municipal synergies. This entails identifying planning tools and financial resources so that we can again, make sure that there is access. One example that I wanna talk about that's already in play is that the state has recently been awarded $1.9 million in brownfield assessment grant funding. This is coming from the US Environmental Protection Agency. And those, it's been four awards and the recipients have been Humboldt County, the city of Las Vegas, the, Los, the Henderson Redevelopment Agency, and the Nye County Coalition. They each submitted proposals that represented projects that range from uh, assessing former gas stations in urban Las Vegas and Henderson to focusing on tribal solid waste facilities in mine scarred lands. And because these monies will be used to address economic, social, and environmental challenges caused by brownfields and stimulating economic opportunity, they actually do deliver on the Justice 40 initiative. And the third step involved in building this infrastructure involves awareness building. We're gonna be identifying opportunities and platforms from which to introduce or explain climate change impacts on vulnerable communities and how advocacy built around environmental justice can serve these communities and to identify and tap available resources to carry out this component. Uh, some examples, uh, we're gonna be engaging the Nevada State Diversity and Inclusion Liaisons. Um, Senator Scheibel, this is a recognition of Senate Bill 222. And uh, this is from the last legislative session. And as a result of that bill, it has provisioned that to the greatest degree practical, practicable, that each state department 
and government agency, identify a liaison. And this liaison, today we've had 40 actually who've been engaged. And these volunteers serve as points of contact for their respective department and external minority serving organizations to ensure historically underserved communities are aware of their department's available resources and that the minority serving organizations have a dedicated point of contact on behalf of their constituencies. We'll be doing a Justice 40 presentation to, at the July 13th meeting of these liaisons. Another opportunity for awareness building will be taking place um, through the Minority Health and Equity Coalition because of its intersectoral membership. Um, its membership represents public and private organizations who are committed to ensuring health and well being to diverse communities. And they'll be holding a November 18th impact summit and we'll be putting together an environmental justice panel for that. We'll also be engaging academia or institutions that make up the Nevada systems of higher education, NSHE. Partnering with academia will strengthen the work of this team. And for example, um, NOMI, my office, is working with the UNR Larson Institute for Health and Equity. Um, and we just recently began a extreme heat and affordable housing health and all policy pilot. Having only just begun our work in March, additional opportunities to promote the team and resources like Justice 40 are being explored and cultivated. And very soon, the team will be able to host and will be announcing its hosting an event to connect community organizations with resources that we are gonna be hosting ourselves. Thank you very much for the time today. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Ms. Dorch. I really appreciate it. Open it up to members of the committee for questions. Wow, am I not seeing any questions from members of the committee? Are my eyes working okay? Senator Hansen, are you, you still with us up there? Um, so I, I just have uh, uh, one, I, probably more of a comment, um, but I, I just appreciate, first of all, giving us an update on the activities um, uh, of this group, uh, especially considering that it you know, was formed fairly recently, but it seems like you've already come uh, quite a way in, in terms of planning out some activities, um, having some key goals, um, and, and you know, I'm excited to see how you know, particularly some of the stakeholder engagement um, uh, progresses on this. You know, I, I would say that I think there's probably a lot of interest um, uh, you know, among uh, members of the legislature in seeing what, what comes from some of that community engagement, um, both in terms of uh, you know, potential ideas and solutions to, to address some of the disparities. Uh, and then I, you know, another thing that I think has just come up across this meeting today is, um, and that you mentioned as well, is, is data and uh, being able to, um, you know, to get data that shows where some of these impacts are. And while we are making progress in those areas, uh, I think that there are probably still gaps. Um, I appreciate the mention of the mapping uh, tool that, um, that the White House has put out. I know that many other states are working on those as well. Um, I think ultimately um, we're going to probably need to get uh, some of those folks in academia that you just mentioned um, together with some of our state agencies because at the end of the day I think we are going back to the idea of silos. We, I think we can map a lot of different things. We can map some uh, public health um, indicators and, and rates of different um, uh, health uh, ailments. We have maps uh, through our environmental regulator of air quality or water quality um, discharges. Um, you know, we, we now have some mapping of heat, um, but I think uh, being able to start combining these things as well as probably some other things that haven't even come up yet uh, to be able and, and layering those together, uh, we can really get a sense of where those impacts are stacking up and where some of the correlations are, uh, and then and, and that can help inform uh, any programmatic responses, but it can also just inform uh, community out uh, efforts towards um, 
you know, um, education and and uh, tackling some of these issues. So really excited to see how some of uh, these efforts can help inform us, again, both on where the, where the data gaps are, um, but also figuring out how we can start to pull together some of these things that I think exist in different places um, so that we can get a little bit more of a comprehensive picture. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time to present to us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing the, the results of, um, uh, of your work and, and to continuing to work with you. Uh, that moves us to the last item on our agenda, which is our second period of public comment. Uh, again, to call in, please dial 669-900-6833. When prompted, please enter meeting ID 814-6977-2189 and then press the pound key and our broadcast production services staff will indicate to you when it is your turn to speak. Please remember to clearly state and spell your name and limit your comments to three minutes. We don't have anyone left in the audience here in Las Vegas. It looks like everyone is left in Carson City as well. Uh, uh, if not, head on up to the table, but uh, uh, BPS, uh, let's see if anyone wants to provide public comment by phone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Oh, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. All right. Thank you very much. That concludes our lengthy meeting for today. Our next and final meeting of the Natural Resources Committee will be Monday, August 22nd. And I want to note, as uh, some of our other members have stated, the Subcommittee on Public Lands will be holding its final meeting uh, on June 27th uh, at Pyramid Lake. Uh, with that, thank you for your time. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>